and welcome to our series of lectures on the Hellenistic Age. Historians usually like to think of history as occurring in neat and distinct periods where they can divide up time and look at separate societies as they exist during that period. But of course, history really isn't that neat. But in this case, in the case of the Hellenistic Age, there really is a definite distinction, a clear marker that separates the Greek world of before 330 BC and the Greek world after that time. And the distinction is Alexander the Great. Rarely has there been a period in human history that relied more on the genius of one man to distinguish his reign and the entire period that came after him from everything that came before. Now in the 19th century when historians looked at the periods of Greek history, they like to think of three periods as marking the development of any culture. Uh, an archaic period during which that culture began to grow and to develop, a classical period when that society reached its maturation, and then a period of decadence when things began to fall apart. And it was applying that system to Greek history that led the German historian Droysen to coin the phrase Hellenistic because in his model of Greek history, which divided Greek history up into three periods, that period of initial growth, that period during which the Greeks were first developing their distinctive culture, was the archaic period. It was the period when they colonized the Mediterranean, when they made the first steps towards democracy, when they acquired their alphabet from the Eastern Mediterranean, and so forth. And then, according to Droysen, in the classical age, uh, the Greeks reached the, the height of their civilization. This was the age of Pericles, the age of Socrates, the age of the Athenian Empire, of the Parthenon, of Greek philosophy, of Greek tragedy, uh, written by Aeschylus and Sophocles and Euripides. And in this model of three phases of civilization, according to Droysen, the last phase was the Hellenistic, deriving its name from the Greek word for Greece, in fact, Hellas. This Hellenistic phase was supposedly the decadent phase, the period that came after the classical age when the Greeks were at their height. Well, we still use these distinctions as far as periods are concerned. We still talk about archaic and classical and Hellenistic. But I'm hoping that this course of lectures will persuade you that it is entirely wrong to think of the Hellenistic age as a period of decadence or decline. It isn't the period during which the Greeks lose their genius. Rather, it is the dynamic period of Greek history when, in fact, Greek civilization is spread over a much broader canvas than ever before. This is the first thing that I want to introduce in our study of the Hellenistic Age. It is a period during which the scale of Greek culture is unlike anything that has come before. Prior to this, the Greek world has been essentially mainland Greece, the Aegean, the western coast of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and some Greek colonies further west in, say, Sicily. But now, thanks to Alexander and his conquests, Greek civilization will be spread across an entirely new canvas so that Greek armies following Alexander will march from Macedon all the way to the Hindu Kush, to the Indus Valley, and to the Punjab plain of northwest India. This is dramatically new. If you think about the modern nation states, which in antiquity, uh, during which their, their regions would have been part of the Hellenistic world, one finds an extraordinary list. One could include Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Egypt, Libya, uh, uh, Arabia. Uh, one could include uh, Iraq and Iran and uh, what was formerly known as Persia and also uh, Afghanistan. All these areas now are areas which now during the 3rd century BC down to the 1st century BC were brought into the Greek world. They received Greek culture as Greek colonists following Alexander came and settled here. So it is a period that is one of completely new scale for Greek culture. And as the scale increases, so does the presentation of power in the Greek world. Everything gets larger. It is like Greek culture on steroids. In the classical world, the Greeks had used triremes, war boats that had three banks of oars. Now in the Hellenistic period, we'll find naval battles where the ships have banks of five oars, or ten, or fifteen banks of oars. Everything is getting larger and larger. 
And it will be a period also where we'll see a great deal of anxiety as people begin to worry about their place in the world because the old certainties have now been shattered. A world in which people will explore the psychology of the individual in the Greek novel and in Greek epic poems in which the torment of the individual will be expressed in Greek art, as we're going to see later in these lectures. A period during which Greek philosophers will be concerned with the question of establishing inner harmony and peace as they deal with the anxiety of this new age. And, because it's an age of anxiety, also an age in which people turn more and more towards astronomy and uh, astrology and casting spells and using magic to control their lives and the lives of other people. So it's going to be a Greek world or a Greek culture that's unlike anything that we've seen before in the classical or the archaic periods. And looming over all of this is one man, Alexander, Alexander the Great. Now Alexander's accomplishments, which we're going to look at in the next couple of lectures, would not have been possible but for the fact that his father conquered Greece. And so we have to begin even before Alexander, in this, the first lecture of our series, with Philip, Philip II, the king of Macedon. When we look at Macedon, we find that the relationship between Macedon and Greece is a highly complex one. It certainly remains that today. At the moment, there is a region of northern Greece, a province of the current uh, Greek Republic known as Macedon, and yet there is also a former Yugoslav Republic that claims the name of Macedon. And so it's still a vexed issue. What is the relationship between Macedon and Greece? You'll still hear today Greeks defiantly proclaiming Macedon was, is, and ever will be Greek. But the reality is actually very complex and more complicated than that. Macedon was a part of Greece, but it was also somewhat distinct and different from the rest of Greece. The Greece of the classical world and of the south and central parts of the Greek peninsula was an area made up primarily of city-states, polis as the Greeks called them. Small areas centered around a particular city, each governed by either a democracy where virtually all the citizen men were uh, members of the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the ruling group of that uh, society, or oligarchies, where the franchise was restricted to a narrower group, say the aristoi, the aristocrats, or the, uh, the wealthy merchant class in Corinth, for example. Macedon was actually unlike either one of these models, because Macedon was a kingdom located in the northern part of the Greek peninsula, and it was a kingdom where power was not strongly centralized in the hands of the Agiad dynasty, the family that provided the rulers of Macedon. There were, in fact, inland areas, we can call them cantons or fiefdoms, if you like, where local barons ruled sometimes almost independently. These were the barons, the, the ruling class, the aristocratic elite, if you like, of Macedonian society. You might like to think, I'd suggest, you might like to think about the relationship between Greece and Macedon as being something like the relationship between Scotland and England. Geographically connected, culturally overlapping, and yet in some fundamental ways also quite distinct and different. Now, the Greeks themselves were interested in the question of what makes a Greek a Greek, and were the Macedonians Greek? Well, we fortunately have a guide to the way that the Greeks understood their own ethnicity. Herodotus tells us in a celebrated passage that there were four ways of determining who was a Greek. And in Herodotus's formulation, the elements that made up your ethnic identity were your blood, expressed in genealogy, who was your father and who was his father, the language that you spoke, the religion that you followed, and the customs that you used in your daily life. So let's use these Greek criteria to look at the Macedonians. Well, first of all, on the question of blood. The Greeks expressed their Greekness through a series of heroic genealogies so that every Greek could claim descent from a heroic forefather. And eventually, above all of these, at the very beginning of all these genealogies, was Hellas, the man from whom the Hellenes, the Greeks, took their name. Now, the Macedonians were a part of the heroic genealogy of the Greeks, but they were out on the very edge of this genealogy, as if the Greeks of 
say, Athens and Thebes and Argos and Sparta, thought of the Macedonians as being distant cousins. Greek, but Greek with a question mark, perhaps. What about language? Well, our best evidence here is from the inscriptions and the many personal names that we know of individual Macedonians themselves. And here we can state fairly safely that the Macedonians appear to have spoken Greek. That's certainly the language they used for their inscriptions, and the names of the individual Macedonians are Greek names. So it looks as if, from the point of view of language, the Macedonians spoke a dialect of Greek. It may have sounded a little odd to people down in Athens, but it would have been intelligible and understood. What about from the point of view of religion? Well, once again, we find the same mixture of both Greekness and non-Greekness contributing to the Macedonian identity. For example, there's good evidence in Macedon that Zeus, the father of gods and men, as he's called by Hesiod, and Artemis, the virgin goddess who was the hunter and the goddess associated with wild places, both of these gods were worshipped in Macedon. And these are clearly Greek gods. But on the other hand, there's also evidence for the popularity of a goddess called Bendis, who's a Thracian goddess. In other words, the Greeks would have thought of her as being vaguely foreign, not quite the same as the Olympian gods. And there's another goddess called Enodia, a goddess who's normally shown riding on a horse and carrying a torch. And she really has no close parallels in the southern Greek world. So the Macedonians betray their relationship to the Greeks of the south and also to the peoples further north of them, the Thracians, the so-called barbarian people in the eyes of the southern Greeks. And what about custom? Well, here we have, in fact, an anecdote that perfectly expresses the relationship between the Greeks and the Macedonians. The best way that you could show that you were Greek in the eyes of other Greeks was to participate in the Olympic Games. The Olympic Games were one set of what are called the Pan-Hellenic Games, games that were held every four years but were only open to Greeks for participation. So if you could participate there, it meant that the judges of the games, who were in fact known as the Greek judges, the Hellenodikai, it meant that in their eyes you were Greek. Now a Macedonian king, Alexander I, wanted to participate in the Olympic Games. And when he went to Olympia, on his first try, he was rejected by the Hellenodikai, the judges of the Greeks. Why? Presumably because they didn't believe he was really Greek. And so what he had to produce was a family tree that showed that his family, the ruling family of Macedonia, was in fact related to the Argives. So it had a good Greek pedigree. Now I think this perfectly expresses the, the relationship of Greeks and Macedonians. The ruling class likes to see itself as Greek, but in the eyes of the southern Greeks, the civilized Greeks, the men from Macedon were really somewhat suspect. What transformed the relationship between these two sides was the career of one man, Philip II, because it was Philip who united the Macedonians and eventually conquered the Greeks, making the distinction between the two uh, almost meaningless. Ironically, Philip probably never expected to become a king of Macedon. The reason for that is that even though he was a prince, his father Amintas III ruled from 393 to 370, Philip had two older brothers and both of them preceded him to the throne. Alexander II was the king of Macedon briefly in 370 to 368. He was killed by his brother-in-law. And then later, in 360, uh, Philip's older brother, Alexander, the, excuse me, Perdiccas III, ruled from uh, 360 to 359 before dying in battle, fighting against the Illyrians. So Philip probably didn't expect to become the king of Macedon, but death uh, cleared the path for him. The early history of Macedon is uh, a fluctuating story. It's one of territorial expansion when the kingship is strong and when the kingdom is united. But then there is always the threat of invasion from the tribes that lie on the outskirts of the Macedonian realm. The Illyrians to the northwest, the Tribali and the Paiones to the north and the northeast. And, as you can already see in Philip's own family, there is always the threat of internal discord as different groups are vying for power. So at time, the inland regions of Macedon, these fiefdoms or these, uh, uh, these areas ruled by barons, if you will, were under central authority, and at other times they were relatively independent. 
And it's this combination of internal discord and internal weakness and external threat that prevents Macedon from playing a more considerable role in the affairs of the Greeks during the classical period. Back in the 5th century, most Greeks would have thought of Macedon as nothing more than a good place where you could get timber for ships. It was marginal to the concerns of the Greeks. When Perdiccas III, Philip's older brother, died in 359 BC, Philip still did not technically come to the throne. Rather, he served as regent for Perdiccas' son, who reigned now as the child uh, King Amintas IV. Philip soon killed his nephew, though, and took over establishing his own family as the ruling family of Macedon. His early reign was taken up with establishing his authority by making firm the borders of Macedon. He was involved in warfare with the three major tribes on the outskirts of Macedon that threatened their security. And the three techniques that he used in order to establish his authority and to end these wars are hallmarks of his success. He uses them repeatedly throughout his career. The three are diplomacy, bribery, and alliance. In the case of warfare, at which he was very good, Philip had been trained in the techniques of hoplite warfare when as a child and as a young man he had lived in Thebes. And here he had learned the techniques which he applied to the heavily armed battalion of Macedonian soldiers known as the phalanx. This phalanx made up of thousands of men tightly packed, each holding an 18-foot-long pike, required extraordinary attention to detail and drilling constantly. But it was an almost uh, impossible task to face the phalanx and to resist its attack if it hit on open ground. And it was by training this army, this national army, that Philip really established his uh, later successes. At the same time, in some instances, he simply found that it was easier to buy off his opponents. And so his reign began with him going massively into debt as he spent vast amounts of money to buy peace with the northern tribes. And when conquering them in war or buying them off with a bribe didn't work, he married their daughters. And so we find that Philip during his career ended up with something like nine wives. Not consecutively, like Liz Taylor, but rather all at once, establishing a great deal of peace and harmony, no doubt. After securing the western and northern borders of his kingdom, Philip's ambitions turned south and east. And this was an ominous development for the Greeks, because south of Macedon lies mainland Greece. Once he'd captured the gold mines of Mount Pangaion, which lie just on the eastern edge of Macedon, he found himself equipped with an extraordinarily rich supply of gold and silver with which he could pay for the training and equipping of a large national army. And it was with this army that he was able to embark on a series of campaigns in the first region of Greece, the three-pronged peninsula that sticks out into the Aegean on its northwestern corner known as Chalcidice. And here he came up against Greek towns such as Tyrone, Olynthus, and Amphipolis. Tyrone, for, excuse me, Olynthus, for example, he leveled to the ground after he'd captured it. His attack on Amphipolis brought him into conflict with the Athenians because the Athenians regarded Amphipolis as their own colony. And so it was now for the first time that the Athenians began to pay close attention to Philip's ambitions in the Aegean and in Greece in general. His thirst for expansion was endless. People have sometimes asked me what I think Philip was aiming at, and historians often wonder what exactly was his goal. I don't believe that Philip had a concrete goal. He really simply wanted to get more and more power and territory. That is all that is... That is all that is needed to explain the endless campaigning of Philip II and his Macedonians. His expansion was relentless. Eventually, it took him across the northern coast of the Aegean, across through Thrace, all the way to the Hellespont, the Dardanelles, the strip of water that separates Europe from Asia. And as well, not only campaigning east of Macedon, but south, he marched into Thessaly, where he intervened in a civil war, and after establishing peace in Thessaly, was able to take over as commander-in-chief of the Thessalian forces, the Targos, as the Thessalians called it. 
Philip's move into southern Greece, bringing him against Athens and the states of southern Greece, came as a result of the Sacred War, a war that lasted from 357 to 346, and which was precipitated by the attack on Delphi, the holiest shrine of Greece, uh, when it was seized by the people of Phocis, the neighboring tribe that lived around Delphi. Philip marched south. He used the capture of uh, of Delphi as a pretext, proclaiming himself a liberator who, as head of the Thessalian forces rather than as Macedonian king, would march south and set free the God's sanctuary. This march south came in 350 BC and the Athenians were mightily alarmed. They knew that a large army of a Macedonian phalanx and Thessalian cavalry marching into central Greece could keep on marching all the way to Athens and into the Peloponnese. And so heroically they sent a force to Thermopylae, that hallowed spot where 130 years earlier the forces of the Spartans had held up the advance of the Persians. And in this bottleneck at Thermopylae, the Athenians set up a garrison and prevented Philip from marching any further south. He, this time, retreated. He did not give battle, but he retreated, as he said, like a battering ram to strike all the harder the next time he came. This second occasion came in 346 BC when he marched south and he seized both Thermopylae and Delphi at the same time. The Athenians recognized that they had been outmaneuvered and Demosthenes began frantically trying to raise an alliance of the various Greek states against Philip. And once again, he outfoxed everyone's expectations and withdrew, leaving Delphi, as he'd said, liberated. And so we go into a period of a kind of hiatus from about 346 for the next eight years as Philip campaigns further in the north and in the east. But then in 338, a war broke out, the Fourth Sacred War broke out around Delphi. And once again, Philip marched south. Once again, he came to Thermopylae. But this time, he didn't march on to Delphi. He marched into the plain of Chironia, heading towards Athens. And it was here that the Athenians, joined by their Theban allies, marched to the plain on the western side of Thebes at Chironia. And in 338, in a battle between the force of the Athenians and the Thebans on one side and the Macedonian phalanx on the other, the Greeks were defeated and Philip and the Macedonians were victorious. The Battle of Chironia, the last day on which the Greeks would be free until the War of Independence against Turkey in the 1820s AD. A long period of subjugation coming up. On this day at Chironia, when Philip was victorious, he commanded the right wing, and on the left wing was his 16-year-old son, Alexander. Clearly, the heir designate, the man who would take over from Philip after his death. Now, what came next for Philip was an attempt to pacify the Greeks who he just conquered. Rather than rubbing, his nose in, uh, rubbing their nose excuse me, in his victory and proclaiming himself king of Greece, instead he convened a convention of the Greeks at Corinth. And here he established a new league, a Hellenic League. So very carefully he was trying to position himself as the leading man of Greece, but he did not claim royal authority. Instead, he proclaimed himself the captain general of the Greek forces. Greek forces for what? For a campaign against Persia. For 130 years, the Greeks had hated the Persians because of the Persian sack of Athens and because of the invasion of Greece. And for 130 years, Greek intellectuals had recognized that in the world of Greece where every state was out for itself and where warfare continued year after year, the one thing that united the Greeks was their hatred of Persia. In the 370s, a Greek intellectual named Isocrates wrote to Philip and actually invited him uh, excuse me, not the 370s, it was somewhat later than that. Isocrates wrote to Philip asking him to take on the role of Captain General 
of the Greeks. And other Greek philosophers, such as Plato, had tried to, to make men like King Dionysus of Syracuse think of themselves as philosopher kings who would lead the Greeks to a new age of unification. And so Philip had learnt his lesson well, recognizing that he should not try to conquer the Greeks and force them to his will, but rather appeal to them, appeal to the one thing that would unite them and would take them off on a new grand quest. This time, what he proposed was nothing less than an invasion of Persia. And so after 338, we actually find the Macedonians continuing their preparations for war, even though they pacified all of Greece. But these preparations for war take place on the other side of the Hellespont, as the advanced forces of Philip's army actually claim a portion of Asia Minor as the beachhead for what is coming, the invasion of Persia by the Macedonian forces. And yet, when that invasion is just on the brink of occurring, when Philip is about to change everything and to go from being a Macedonian king and the conqueror of the Greeks to being the captain general of this invasion army, he's cut down. He's celebrating a festival back in Macedon. He has just had 12 statues of the Olympian gods brought in to the theater with a 13th statue following, a statue of Philip himself, as if he is claiming some kind of semi-divine status. And now at the very peak of his glory, just as he is ready to embark on the next great stage of his uh, military career, he is assassinated. People would love to know by whom. Well, we have the name of the actual assassin, but the assassin and his accomplices were cut down virtually straight away leaving people to speculate uh, a great deal afterwards about who it was that assassinated Philip and exactly why. I'll give you a clue. Many people think that the person who gained most from this was Alexander. And so it's quite possible that Alexander's career, which would take up exactly where, these fa where his fathers had left off, was the result, in fact, of yet another one of the internecine disputes of one of the, 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 the feuds uh, within the Macedonian royal family. From such inglorious beginnings, however, would uh, erupt the campaign of Alexander, which would take a Macedonian and Greek army across into the realm of Asia Minor before heading further east and south as far as Egypt, and then across through the Persian Empire, conquering the great king of Persia and eventually establishing Greek culture as far away as India. It would take Greek culture from Athens to Afghanistan, and yet it would be built on the lack of independence back in Greece itself. And so we begin the Hellenistic age then with an irony. It is a world built on the glories of Greek culture at the very time when Greece itself is losing its political independence. And it is going to be a story in which the same kinds of ambiguities exist throughout. Will Greek culture reach all levels of the world that it conquers? No. Instead, I'm going to be arguing that there is very little fusion between the Greek culture brought by Alexander's armies and the native cultures that already existed. In fact, I'm going to suggest to you that there is no fusion at all in this world, but rather a thin overlay of Greek culture at the very top. Quite frankly, if you were a Syrian peasant under the Persians, or a Syrian peasant under Alexander, or a Syrian peasant under Alexander's successors, the Seleucids, it wouldn't matter. You spoke the same language and you thought the same way, and you were still oppressed by the overlords that ruled above you. But what would be different is that cities would be planted throughout the Middle East, Egypt, Asia Minor. And these cities would be ruled by urban elites. And these urban elites would become Greek. Whether they were born in Greece, whether they were colonists, didn't matter. But rather, they would acquire Greek culture and they would speak Greek. And it would be this urban elite ruling the entire Near East and Middle East that would bring Hellenism from Greece to the whole world, from the Mediterranean to the Indus Valley. And in our next lecture, we'll begin the story in detail with the story of Alexander the Great.
In 338 BC, the Macedonians defeated the Greeks at the Battle of Chironia. Philip II was victorious after a career spent planning to extend his reign and his territory. He defeated the Athenians and the Thebans, but he proved to be magnanimous in victory. He sent Alexander, his 16-year-old son, who had commanded the left wing at Chironia, to bring back the ashes of the Athenian war dead to the city of Athens as a mark of respect and of honour for fallen foes. So at the age of 16, Alexander was clearly marked for greatness by his father. He had been given the highest military, military command in Macedon other than that of commanding the right wing of the phalanx, which Philip had done, and he had now acted as an ambassador on behalf of the king to the most prestigious of the southern Greek states. Clearly, Alexander at 16 was the heir designate to his father, Philip II. And yet, as we saw in the lecture last time, affairs in Macedon could change very rapidly, and the conflicts within the royal family were sometimes hard to fathom and could be certainly dangerous to the health of the people who ended up on the wrong side. A year later, by 337, Alexander had fallen out of Philip's good graces. And the reason for this, and this probably ended up contributing to Philip's murder in 336, was that late in his life, Philip had taken yet another bride. But the difference was, whereas we've seen his earlier brides tended to be from regions around Macedon, and they were brides whom he married because of alliances that he needed with outlying tribes, on this occasion, Philip had betrothed himself to a young Macedonian girl named Cleopatra. Her father, Attalus, was one of the Macedonian nobles who formed the officer corps of Philip's army. And at the betrothal feast for the, uh, celebrating the upcoming wedding of Philip and Cleopatra, Attalus proposed a toast, drinking the good health of the bride and wishing the happy couple a fruitful marriage that would produce a legitimate Macedonian heir. One can imagine Alexander's reaction. Was he not the Macedonian heir? Well, perhaps, but he was certainly not, in the eyes of some of the other Macedonians, a legitimate Macedonian, because his mother, Olympias, was actually a princess from Epirus, the kingdom located immediately to the west of Macedon. So that, from one point of view, Alexander was only half a Macedonian, and the toast of Attalus was clearly a slight at Alexander. But more than that, it also raised the possibility that if Philip, who was still a strong man, were to father a child on this young girl, Cleopatra, that child might be or might become the heir designate if the child grew to be, say, 20 years of age while Philip was still alive. So Alexander's rage was prompted both by the immediate insult and by the sudden spectre of his being shunted out of power. He flew into a rage at the wedding feast. He drew his sword, stood to Atlas and said, what does that make me, a bastard, you villain? At which point, not Atlas, but Philip drew his sword. And the two men, the Father and son, both in rage, nearly cut each other to pieces until they were separated by the other men and soldiers at the feast. It was a dramatic rupture in what otherwise appeared to be a smooth motion towards power by Alexander. His mother withdrew from Macedon, estranged from her husband Philip. Alexander temporarily left as well until he was persuaded that Philip would accept him back again and that they should resolve their differences. But in 336, in the following year, when Philip marched into a festival behind the statues of the Olympian gods and a statue of himself as well, and on that occasion when Philip was cut down, there was still bad blood between him and his son, despite the fact that only two years earlier they had celebrated the most glorious military victory of Macedon's history. Philip entered the theater, was stabbed in the chest, and his assassin shortly afterwards was cut down as well.
Now, there were many theories in antiquity about the death of Philip. There were stories that uh, Philip had failed to intervene when his, uh, the, his later assassin had been dishonored and that the man had held a grudge against Philip. But there were also those who claimed that Alexander had engineered the whole thing and that the death of the assassins rather conveniently covered the trail so that Alexander came to power unhindered. We'll never know the truth. Some modern scholars have believed that Alexander was implicated, but there is simply not enough evidence, and you cannot hold a man uh, in court 2,500 years after events like this have passed. The charge can't be proved, but it is certainly true that Alexander profited mightily by the timing of Philip's death in 336. As we saw last time, at the time of his death, Philip was actually planning the invasion of Persia. He was going to lead a combined army, not as the conqueror of Greece, but rather as the captain general of all the Greek forces in a war that would avenge the Greeks for what had been done to them by the Persians 130 years earlier. And Alexander simply took over the plans that his father had already laid. In 334, he crossed the Hellespont, and in good Macedonian fashion, he hurled his spear into the ground. The claim that Asia Minor was spear one territory was the claim that began the campaign of conquest against the Persians. Now the first of Alexander's three great victories over the Persians came early in his campaign. It was shortly after crossing over into Asia Minor that Alexander was brought to battle by the forces of the local satraps or provincial governors left in charge of the area by the Persian king. This took place at the Granicus River in northwestern Asia Minor and Alexander was entirely successful. Now I'm not going to spend a great deal of time in this series of lectures on the details of military history, although it's a fascinating topic, but there is one aspect of the victory at the Granicus River that deserves to be mentioned. The ancient sources put the victory down to the reckless courage of Alexander. And it is true that throughout his career, Alexander led from the front, always putting himself in danger before endangering the lives of any of his men. And the effect of this, I think, was to make his army feel astonishingly devoted to the personality of that one man. He was a very, very successful commander because his men loved him. But it's actually not that point that I want to make about the Battle of the Granicus. It's this. Up until this time, the major fa battles fought by the Greeks, either amongst themselves or against the Persians, had been battles won by the forces of their infantry. Hoplites, heavily armed soldiers wearing a shield that protected them from the neck to the knee. And then a bronze helmet and bronze grease below meant that the individual heavily armed Greek infantryman was, a, was wearing 60 pounds of bronze armor. And these men would stand in close formation with their shields protecting both themselves and also the body of the man next to them as well. And it had been the mass of these men that had won the victories in Greek battles up until now. People have sometimes observed that Greek battles were often like tugs of war with the two sides pushing against each other until one side broke and the other side followed. But Alexander introduced a change in tactics, a dramatic change. Prior till now, the cavalry had only been used either on the wings to skirmish at the edges of the hoplite battalion, or once one line had broken, the cavalry would pour into the gap that had been created and would cut down the forces of the enemy as they fled. Cavalry had not really been used as a tactical weapon. But now, Alexander appreciated the potential of the cavalry to break the enemy's forces. That a, a, an attack of cavalry could shatter the line, create a weakness and a break into which his phalanx could then pour, splitting the enemy. And so, while the ancient sources emphasize Alexander's bravery, and it certainly had its effect, I'd like to emphasize his military intelligence his keen understanding as a tactician of the potential of both infantry and cavalry. Once the cavalry had broken and once the, uh, the heavily armed Macedonians then hit the opposite line, the battle turned into a rout. 
You have to imagine that most forces in the Persian army would be made up of lightly armed infantrymen, men carrying either wicker shields or leather shields. They were no match for the heavily armed Greeks and Macedonians. In fact, in most of the battles between Greeks and Persians when it was a close fought fight, it was because the Persians were using Greek mercenaries. So it was the Greek army versus the Greek mercenaries in the Persian army that usually proved to be the essence of the battle. So Alexander, already in 334, has begun his campaign. He's still a young man in his early 20s, and he has won a victory over the great king, the forces of the Persian king. He now begins to think about how he's going to present this entire campaign, how it will be packaged, both to his Greek audience and also to the Persians. And naturally what he does is to think in terms of epic and mythic events in earlier Greek history. He begins to think of this as a new Trojan War with the forces of the Greeks coming east into, uh, in this case, Persia. And he begins to think of himself as a new Achilles, a character straight out of Greek myth, a character who is uh, the son of a goddess, something more than just human, but rather of heroic status. Now, when we use the term hero, we usually mean somebody who's simply done something courageous. To the Greeks, the word hero means something else. A hero is a man who either by his descent or particularly by his actions has actually achieved a semi-divine status. He may be the son of a god or the son of a goddess, or he may be someone who, like Heracles, has done such wonderful deeds, the labors of Heracles were famous, that he's actually been taken up into heaven. These men are not human like you and me. They are superhuman. And the Greeks think of this as a separate uh, category of being. Alexander, I think, already in his early 20s, is propagating that image and may even be believing it himself as well. Plutarch tells us that he used to sleep at night with a dagger under his pillow and a copy of Homer's Iliad, as if he could imbibe overnight in his dreams the very essence of being a Homeric hero. And so it wasn't long before people began to compare his campaign, which had already broken out of the confines of the Greek world and had marched into Asia Minor, as a campaign that was like the labors of Heracles. Heracles himself had wandered far and wide away from the Greek world. Remember that even Gibraltar was known to the Greeks as the pillars of Heracles because he'd gone that far west. And the Greeks also worshipped a god, Dionysus, who was known for having come from far in the east. So that the, the notion of an epic journey, a journey that went far beyond the normal confines of the Greek world, was something that the Greeks were already attuned to thinking of as the work of a god or a hero. And that's what Alexander was plugging into, making these comparisons between himself and these characters, casting his conquest of the East, therefore, not merely as a campaign of vengeance against the Persians, but as a divinely sanctioned campaign with himself in the role of either hero or god. The victory at the Granicus River left Alexander in control of much of Asia Minor, the area that corresponds to what we would now call Western and Central Turkey. And it was followed a year later by another victory of Alexander's at, uh, uh, at the, the Battle of Issus, as it's called in 330 BC. Now, Southern Asia Minor, Southern Turkey, has running along it a range of mountains known as the Taurus Mountains. And between the Taurus Mountains, uh, with Turkey on one side and now Syria on the other, there is a narrow pass, the only pass that allows you conveniently to march an army from what would be now Turkey into Syria, from Asia Minor into Syria. And it was through that pass that Alexander marched his troops, and strangely enough, the Persian army and the Greek army or the Macedonian army actually passed each other in the night. And so it ended up that the Persian forces were closer up to the mountains and it was the Greeks who occupied the more open territory. This was a fortuitous turn of events for Alexander because the Persians had a vastly larger army but were not able to deploy it on great open ground where they could use their numbers to their advantage. The Persian army at this stage was led in fact by the great king himself, Darius. 
And so this was a momentous event in 333 BC as the great king, the king of kings, the one anointed by Ahura Mazda, came all the way across to the western provinces of his empire to face this Macedonian interloper. And here, the Battle of Issus in 333, Alexander once again was stunningly victorious, vanquishing completely the Persian army. And so now, in only two years of campaigning, and with only two battles, Alexander had extended the possessions of the Macedonians and the Greeks from the Aegean, their original homeland, all the way to the headwaters of the Euphrates River. If you look at that on a map, you'll find that that essentially doubles the land mass under the control of the Greeks in two years and two battles. Now, I talked in the first lecture about the scale of the Hellenistic world, and we get some taste of it here. The scale of these victories cannot be measured by the Greeks. It is so much larger than anything that has ever happened before. And because it is off the scale of what the Greeks can comprehend, it raises some very interesting questions for Alexander. No Greek and no Macedonian has ever faced the issue before of how to deal with the Greeks and how to deal with the Persians, both as subjects within the same empire. What is the basis of his authority? He's not the ancestral king of Persia. He wasn't born the son of the Persian king. So how should Alexander behave towards the Greeks and the Persians? Well, we're fortunate in that we actually have documentary evidence to give us a clear idea of what Alexander thought of his authority at this stage of his career. To the Greeks, he simply styled himself as King Alexander. He doesn't say Alexander, King of Greece, nor does he say Alexander, King of the Macedonians, but I think that that is probably what he implies. Simply King Alexander, something greater than they've ever seen before. We have a wonderful document that comes to us from around 334 BC, and I want to read you uh, some of it because it is a document that contains a decree of Alexander's, a decree written to the people of the island of Chios. These are Greeks who are now behind the line of advance, and they've written to Alexander to ask him to settle their internal affairs. And what you'll see in this document is a good illustration of how Alexander is dealing with his Greek subjects. A letter from King Alexander to the Chian people. All those who have been in exile from Chios shall return home. The constitution that exists in Chios shall be democratic. Law writers shall be chosen to write and correct the laws in order that nothing opposed to the democracy or the return of exiles shall be in the laws. Whatever has been corrected or written shall be referred to Alexander. The Chians shall provide 20 manned triremes at their own expense, and these triremes shall sail as long as the rest of the fleet of the Greeks sails with us. And so it goes on with a few more stipulations. What is very significant about this is that we see a combination of interesting idealism and practicality. The practical stipulation in here is that the people of Chios have to provide 20 boats for Alexander. He's still marching with a Greek navy following closely along the coastline in support of him and to make sure that a Persian fleet doesn't come in behind Alexander and either destroy his lines of communication or attack him from the rear. So that's a practical, uh, a practical stipulation. But at the same time we find that it is Alexander who is guaranteeing that the Chians shall be a democracy. In other words, they're not going to be ruled by a Macedonian garrison or a Macedonian commander. They'll be free, or in the words of the Greeks, autonomous, to govern their own affairs. So Alexander's genius expresses itself here. He recognized that the best way to get the Greeks on side was in fact to rule with a very light hand unlike many of his successors who would impose their rule directly on the Greeks, Alexander essentially left the Greeks to rule themselves with the proviso that when they redrafted their laws, they would send them to him for ratification. He's acting as a kind of uh, supreme court, if you will, to make sure that everything is exactly as he wants it to be. So here we have King Alexander, the Macedonian king, uh, the, the legal expert, ruling very lightly and encouraging the autonomy of the Greeks. But to the Persians, a completely different story. 
To them, Alexander presented himself quite differently because he now had defeated the Persians twice in battle and he demonstrated that he was the equal of the great king. And so to the Persians, Alexander presented himself as a character every bit on a par with Darius. We have a letter that Alexander apparently wrote to Darius and here you'll find, I think, that the tone of his communication to the Persians is very different from what he has to say to the Greeks. And I want you to listen to what he says about his own authority. He writes to Darius, Your ancestors invaded Macedonia and Greece and caused havoc in our country, although we'd done nothing to provoke them. As supreme commander of all Greece, I invaded Asia because I wished to punish Persia for this act. I took the field against you. But it was you who began the quarrel. First I defeated in battle your generals and satraps. Now I have defeated yourself and the army you led. By God's help, I am master of your country and I have made myself responsible for the survivors of your uh, force. Come to me, therefore, orders King Alexander, as you would come to the lord of the continent of Asia. Should you fear to suffer any indignity, I will give you the proper guarantees. Come then and ask me for your mother, who Alexander had captured in this battle, and ask me for your wife, who he also had captured, and your children, and anything else you please. For you shall have them, and whatever, and whatever besides you can persuade me to give you. And in future, he says, and now we hear the king talking to his fellow king, let any communication you wish to make with me be addressed to the king of all Asia. So Alexander to the Greeks is something very different from what he is to uh, the, the uh, Persians. Now you may wonder why I'm belaboring this point. Clearly, the way you deal with your own people and the way you deal with an enemy is going to be somewhat different. That's fairly obvious, yes. But what I want to do here is to establish an important point, I think a fundamental point in the interpretation of Alexander. Alexander was caught between two cultures that had very different ways of viewing the world. Two cultures that had very different ways of understanding authority and power. And what I'm going to be suggesting is that Alexander couldn't reconcile the difference between these. That in fact, you cannot be the first among equals, as you would be as a Macedonian, with being a semi-divine supreme autocrat, as you must be amongst the Persians. So the beginnings, I think, of a deep conflict between the cultures is to be found right here in Alexander's correspondence both to the Greeks and to Darius. After the Battle of Issus, Alexander turned south to secure the coastal cities of Tyre and Sidon. And from here, before pursuing Darius inland, which would be the last phase of his, uh, his uh, victory over the Persians, Alexander instead headed for Egypt. Now, I want to talk about this episode for a moment because this is really quite a critical moment in Alexander's career. First of all, why did he go there? Well, people will be talking in a moment about the oracle of Zeus at Siwa, which Alexander went to visit, and that's going to be an important part of his reign. But we shouldn't neglect something more basic, and that is there is a tactical and strategic reason for going to Egypt. You do not want to leave a large Persian province, as Egypt was at this point, in your rear as you march inland east across towards Iraq and Iran. You don't want to do that because Persian forces back there may invade Greece, send a navy towards Macedon, and you'll find yourself having to scurry back again. So he is, he is establishing his conquest in an orderly fashion to make it possible later to march further east. This explains his campaign in Egypt in general, but as I'm sure you're all aware, the Kingdom of Egypt, which was now a Persian province, is essentially just the Nile Valley and the delta of the River Nile. But when Alexander marched into Egypt, he didn't stay just in the delta and just on the river. He didn't merely go to Memphis. He marched further west, even further, going across the coastline of the Mediterranean as far as the modern-day location of Mirza Matru, and then turning south and marching into the desert until he came to the oracle of a god known as Zeus Amon, located um, at Siwa, at the oasis of Siwa. And what happened here is... Uh, 
a story that has bedeviled historical analysis for many, many years. Because it appears as if Alexander was greeted as the son of a god. And it also appears as if he entertained that belief quite seriously thereafter. Now, there are many conflicting stories about this, and I won't go through all of them in detail. In some stories, when he arrived at Siwa, he wanted to find out about his father, and so he asked about Philip, but the oracle said, you shouldn't assume that Philip is your father, which made Alexander think, ah, perhaps it's a god rather than Philip. Such double parentage with a human father and really a divine father is very much in the Greek tradition, and that may be what happened. Another story is that as he walked towards the temple, the priests came out to visit him, and they had meant to say, Oh, Pideon, oh, my, my little boy, my, my, my young one, but that their Greek wasn't so good, and when they said it, it came out sounding like, Oh, Pideon, oh, son of Zeus. So perhaps Alexander's belief in his own divinity was based on simply a rather poor pronunciation of Greek. But I'd like to suggest another interpretation, and that is this. By conquering, excuse me, by conquering Egypt, Alexander became Pharaoh. That's, that's a simple given. If you conquered Egypt, you were once again the Pharaoh. And the Memphite priesthood, the priestly group that ruled in Memphis and gave continuity to Egyptian culture for so many centuries, would have recognized Alexander as the new Pharaoh. And one of the titles of pharaohs in late Egyptian history during the Persian period and now in this period was son of Amon. So it is quite likely that in his visit to Egypt, Alexander, in taking on the role now of the pharaoh, in proclaiming himself the inheritor of that royal authority, was ritually recognized with the title son of Amon, and that when he went to Siwa, that same title was bestowed upon him by the priests there in recognition of the fact that it was not merely a Greek or a Macedonian who was visiting their oracle, but rather it was the Pharaoh of Egypt. Now, that makes sense of the events, and it's an explanation of how he came to be known as the son of the God, but what's much more important is what Alexander himself did with this. I've suggested already that he sees himself as another incarnation of the heroic character like Heracles and Dionysus. Being greeted as the son of a God may strike us as being uh, incredibly arrogant, but in fact it fits in with the model of Greek thinking already before Alexander that the great man might be able to accomplish a higher status and become godly, as the Greeks would call it, the theos aner, the godly man. So it's quite possible that Alexander was not merely going through the motions of taking on an Egyptian title, but that he actually was coming to believe this as well. And that in the latter part of his career, Alexander wanted to present himself as a God, as a divine man, as the two together. I somewhat hesitate at advancing that particular view for the simple reason that to give it real credence we'd have to psychoanalyze Alexander and we can't do that. As we're going to see in a later lecture, so much of what we know about Alexander is a result of the way that different sources in antiquity wrote about him. And there was so much romance, and there were so many popular stories, that getting back to the original is very hard to fathom. But what I think we have seen so far is a man who is very aware of the need to package himself to an audience, both to the Greeks and to the conquered people as well whether to the Persians, writing to the great king as the Lord of Asia, or in this instance to the Egyptians, taking on the role of the Pharaoh. And what we find here, I think, is the key to Alexander. He is a man who was trying always throughout his career to reconcile the irreconcilable, to reconcile the demands of Greek culture with the demands of the cultures of the conquered peoples in the Hellenistic world. He makes attempts to reconcile those, 
by presenting himself to his different audiences in different ways. But finally, I'm going to be arguing he's unsuccessful in those attempts. And the best proof of that will be that in the generation after Alexander, none of his successors will try to do the same thing that he did. The great tragedy of Alexander, to my mind, is going to be that none of his generals will attempt to be both Macedonian and Pharaoh in the same way as did Alexander, the blazing star. In our last lecture, we looked at the first half of the meteoric career of Alexander the Great. And we saw that from the foundations established by his father, Philip II, Alexander initiated a campaign of conquest which would demolish the power of Achaemenid Persia and would establish Greek culture as the elite culture of the entire Near and Middle East. During that lecture, I pointed out that it seemed to me that Alexander was faced with a dilemma. How to be both the Macedonian king and a beneficent and gentle king in the eyes of the Greeks, who he wanted to leave essentially ruling themselves, and how to be the king equal in status to the great king of Persia, a role that in fact he would come now to take on when he defeated Darius III. And I suggested that the turning point for him in his attempt to reconcile these two competing demands probably came as a result of his visit to the oracle of Zeus Amon at Siwa in the Libyan desert west of the Nile Valley and Memphis. And here I suggested Alexander found a way to present himself as something that the Greeks would understand as more than just a mortal man, a hero a character that was godly or semi-divine, if you will, something that he learned both because that notion was a part of Greek culture, but also because here he was greeted by the priests as the son of Zeus Amon, a title modeled on his now official title as Pharaoh, the son of Amon. So the visit to Siwa certainly gave Alexander an idea of how to present his kingship. It may also have convinced him that he was in fact a god by blurring the division between the human and the divine. But whatever it did to his psyche, and we'll never know exactly what the truth is there, there was still a much more pressing matter, and that was finally defeating Darius III, the great king of Persia. He had already defeated his forces once at the Battle of the Granicus River, shortly after crossing into Asia Minor in th 334, and a year later, just south of the Taurus Mountains, he had defeated Darius himself at the Battle of Issus. But now it was time for Alexander to begin in uh, a serious way, a campaign that would take his forces way away from the Aegean and the Mediterranean, the, the heartland areas of Greek culture. And so after leaving a Macedonian garrison and a Macedonian governor in control of Egypt, Alexander began marching north back through the modern day regions of Israel, Lebanon and Syria before crossing the caravan trails that headed from northern Syria eastwards towards the headwaters of the Tigris and the Euphrates, the region known to the Greeks as Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers. He had left the Mediterranean behind and he was headed toward the heartland of Persia. Moving into Mesopotamia then, Alexander made his way towards the headwaters of the Tigris River. And here, at the Battle of Galgamela in 331 BC, he met and destroyed convincingly the army of Darius who fled the scene of battle and ran away fleeing to the north and to the east. Some of you may have seen the well-known mosaic depicting this battle which is now uh, located in the National Museum in Naples. The mosaic shows the very moment at which Alexander is breaking through and Darius in his chariot has turned and is fleeing. People in antiquity recognized that that very moment was a turning point in history. 
because it marked the beginning of the end for Persia and the final stage of the ascent of Macedon. Alexander was now Lord of Asia, indeed as much as in title. He continued his victorious march eastwards, descending upon Babylon, and here the city surrendered to him, as did the royal capital of Darius at Susa. Now, it's easy to pass over these events as merely further steps in the continual progression of Alexander's inexorable eastern campaign. But what we should stop and recognize is the astonishing degree of wealth that fell into Alexander's lap as a result of this victory. The wealth that Alexander now had at his disposal vastly outweighed anything that any Greek and probably all of the Greeks combined had ever known in their history previous to this. Once again, this theme I introduced a lecture or two ago of the massive scale of Hellenism, a whole new scale even now of wealth. Consider this fact, a simple comparison that I think illustrates the point nicely. In 480 BC, uh, when the Athenians defeated the Persians and established their empire, the states of the Aegean sent them tribute. And the Athenian Empire's tribute in 480-479 BC amounted to 460 talents. 460 talents. At Susa alone, Alexander captured 40,000 talents of coined money, as well as uncoined bullion, and even 5,000 talents worth of just purple cloth, the cloth used by kings, because it is, its color is made from tiny sea creatures that are crushed to create purple dye. Massively expensive. Ten times more value just in royal cloth than the entire revenue of the Athenian Empire at the, in the early part of the 5th century. So this gives us an idea of the astonishing scale of the wealth that would now begin to move from the Persian Empire towards the Mediterranean. And this wealth would eventually find its way back to Macedon, to the Hellenistic kingdoms of Seleucus in Syria, into Ptolemaic Egypt. And finally, this wealth would make its way even into Rome. Uh, this gold and silver can be melted down and reused time and again. But before Alexander had an opportunity to enjoy this newfound wealth, he had to pursue Darius. Though the king had been beaten in battle, he was still alive. And the Achaemenid king, the last ruler of the Achaemenid dynasty, began retreating away from his royal capitals of Susa and Babylon and moving into the upland country, uh, moving into the area beyond Media towards the Caspian Sea, towards the area known in antiquity as Hyrcania, and across into the regions that would correspond in our geography now to northern Iran right up to the border of modern-day Turkmenistan. However, just as Alexander's army was closing in finally on Darius, the king's own men turned on him and he was assassinated, cut down by a Persian nobleman named Bessus. This was a terrible anticlimax. The entire movement of Macedon into the Persian Empire, this epoch-making campaign that was going to change history forever, had been framed as a personal rivalry between Alexander, representing the vengeance of the Greeks, and Darius, the sitting Achaemenid king, the descendant of the Darius and the Xerxes, who had invaded Greece 130 years, excuse me, 150 years earlier. So it was a terrible anticlimax that Alexander did not get the opportunity to defeat Darius in battle, capture and execute him. But, and here we see another example, I think, of the genius of Alexander, he took this disappointment and he refashioned it now, using it as a brilliant opportunity to change the way that he presented his own authority and power. Because instantly, he went from being the force of Greek vengeance over the Persians to refashioning himself as the Lord of Asia and the legitimate successor of Darius, who would now pursue Darius's assassin in order to bring him to justice. 
And Alexander and his men did this in a forced march, gradually day after day, capturing or catching up to Bessus, capturing him, and eventually having him mutilated, sent back to Babylon, and executed, torn in two. Alexander was now the king of Macedon, King Alexander to the Greeks, the lord of Asia, and the heir to the Achaemenid throne. And the question that really we must pay attention to now is, could these things be reconciled? Could he be all things to all men? And my answer to that is, no, he couldn't, though he tried mighty hard. Now, the key event, the seminal event that illustrates the kinds of tensions that Alexander was dealing with here, comes in 324 at Opus, near Babylon, a town where the Macedonian army briefly mutinied against Alexander. And Alexander, in dealing with this mutiny, tried to establish a reconciliation between Greeks and Persians. And the events that surround this mutiny and the banquet of reconciliation, I think, give us a very clear idea of what was going on in Alexander's kingdom and the relations between the various uh, factions and ethnic groups. Let me read you a part of the description that we have. On arriving at Opus, Alexander called together the Macedonians, and he declared that he was discharging from campaign and sending back to their country all those who were unfit for service. He was instantly uh, allowing to leave all of his veterans going back to Macedon. The presents he would give them would make them an object of even greater envy at home and would encourage the other Macedonians to take part in the same dangers. So the old guard, the men who've been campaigning now for about 10 years, are allowed to go home and a fresh group will be brought in. It was not unreasonable, uh, oh, excuse me, many of the Macedonians, however, were displeased by this and they felt that Alexander despised them. It was not unreasonable for them to take exception to Alexander's words, and they had had many grievances throughout the expedition. And now what will spill out is a whole litany of the grievances that these men feel about Alexander. There was the recurring annoyance of Alexander's Persian dress. He had now begun to dress like the Persian king. We'll talk about the significance of that in a moment. And uh, they hated the fact that he was training barbarian successors, epigonoi as they were called in Greek, uh, his successors or in his inheritors, Persians who would be trained in the Macedonian style of warfare. And the introduction of foreign cavalry into the squadrons of the companion cavalry. Now try to imagine for a moment the attitude of Alexander's veterans. These are men who for 10 years have marched way beyond the Greek world have defeated the Persians in three major battles and now find that their glorious king is dressing like a Persian, is dismissing the Macedonian veterans, is raising young Persians and teaching the Macedonian styles of warfare, and worst of all, is actually including Persian battalions in the Macedonian army. Now, if any of you are veterans, I'm sure that you'll be able to recognize the kind of ill will that was brewing in Alexander's army as a result of this. Why was he doing this? I think it must be that he was planning for the future, that to rule this entire empire which stretched from Macedon to India, he would need to have a ruling caste that included more than simply the old Macedonians who'd fought with him. And so his response to this mutiny, his immediate response, was to go into a sulk and to retire for three days into his tent. until. Uh, after he had worn down his men and his men had come to him and said that they were sorry about this. Uh, and uh, when they said to him that they simply wanted to be recognized as his kinsmen, then he came out of his tent and he saw his men, these beloved soldiers who'd marched with him. And now look at the moment of reconciliation. And this passage is very, very interesting. Alexander came forward to speak but his men remained there imploring him. One of them, whose age and command of the cavalry made him a chief officer, spoke as follows. And he says, Sire, what grieves us, the Macedonians, is that you have already made some Persians your kinsmen. And Persians are called the kinsmen of Alexander and are allowed to kiss you, to come up to him and to kiss him on the cheek. While not one of the Macedonians has been granted this honor. 
And Alexander, understanding the power of the moment, said, I make all of you my kinsmen. All of the Macedonians now are ennobled, uh, the equals, if you like, of the king. And at this, Kalanese stepped forward and kissed him, and so did everyone else who wished. So there is a great moment of uh, reconciliation between them. Now, what Alexander does then, after making a sacrifice, is to order a great banquet to be held. And the banquet uh, begins with this description. He and those around him drew wine from the same bowl and poured the same libation, beginning with the Greek seers and the Magi, the Persian priests. He prayed for other blessings and for harmony, note this, harmony and unity in rule between Macedonians and Persians. It is said that there were 9,000 guests at the banquet. Now, what fairly clearly is happening, I think, at the banquet at Opus, is that Alexander is trying to fashion a policy that will reconcile these former enemies so that the kingdom will have a new ruling elite. He's not asking for the, the unity of all mankind. He's not behaving like some, uh, some religious leader who simply says, can't we uh, bury our differences and all unite together? No, it is a very specific political gesture. Harmony between Greeks and Persians to create a new ruling elite. And I would support that contention that he's actually trying to engineer a new ruling class by noting that he also forced all of his major officers, 80 of them in total, and thousands of his men, possibly up to as many as 10,000, to take Persian wives. Now, I think that dramatically and graphically illustrates exactly what Alexander was trying to do. Because the simple fact is that those couples would have children who would be bicultural and bilingual, both Greek and Persian. Now, of course, many of his men had already taken Persian wives, or at least concubines, camp followers, and these two he tried to recognize by taking these children who'd been born to the marriage of Greeks and foreigners and by training them now as Macedonian soldiers for the future. Alexander the Great was one of the first leaders in history to practice eugenics. He's trying to manufacture a new ruling caste. The description of uh, the marriage of his men to their Persian wives is a fascinating one. Alexander goes through each of the officers and he tries to find a woman who comes from a corresponding family on the Persian side of equal status. So that he specifically gives to Craterus uh, Amastrina, the daughter of Oxiates, who is the brother of Darius. She's, so she is the niece of the great king. And Alexander sat down and charted this very carefully, matching specific women of Persian background to corresponding Greek men. And then as for the Macedonians who'd already married Asian women, we're told, Alexander list, uh, ordered a list of names to be drawn up. They numbered over 10,000, and Alexander gave them wedding gifts. So what we've got here is a very clear attempt, I think, to create a new ruling class. The integration of Persian soldiers both those who'd been trained and those who uh, were, were now brought in as new cavalry battalions, was an attempt to blend the skill of the two groups. And it, of course, recognized the authority of the Persians as equals in empire. Now, this may strike us as merely good sense, but I'd suggest to you that it shows a kind of generosity of spirit and perhaps a, a, a view or a look towards the future on the part of Alexander that is dramatically different. The Greeks have thought of the Persians for 150 years as the enemy. And virtually overnight, the Greek who finally conquers those Persians is inviting them to join in rule. Alexander may have recognized the need for this, for bearing the differences, but his men certainly did not. His introduction of the rituals of the Persian court, his wearing of the gowns of the Persian king, simply infuriated his men. And I think that Alexander finally was unable to reconcile the differences in view between the two. Let me try to illustrate this with one specific example that shows you how far apart these two cultures were. 
In the Persian system, the great king who was anointed by Ahura Mazda is the supreme commander of a hierarchically organized society. And throughout that society, every person has a station. When you meet someone of a higher station, if you are a serf and you meet the bailiff, if you are a bailiff and you meet the landowner, if you are a landowner and you meet the regional governor, and so on and so on, all the way up, when you meet that person, you perform an act of obeisance. You prostrate yourself before your superior. Now, Darius is gone, Bessus is executed, Alexander is the great king. What will his Persians do? They must, of course, prostrate themselves in front of him. And Alexander accepts this as the Persian way of recognizing their king. But Alexander then attempted to introduce the same practice at the court for his Greek and Macedonian subjects. In the Macedonian and, the, and, in, and in the Greek system, excuse me, you greet a powerful man with a kiss because there is an egalitarian spirit amongst the Greeks and the Macedonians, particularly among the leading Macedonians. Many of these were generals who'd fought with Philip. They were even older than Alexander. To him, he was a successful younger man, but they weren't going to prostrate themselves because in the Greek and the Macedonian view of things, that act of obeisance is what you do before a god. So even at the level of court gesture and ritual, Greeks and Persians speak a different language. And as a result, Alexander, by attempting to introduce this Persian practice, only managed to infuriate the people of his court. I'd like to give you the uh, description here of uh, Alexander's attempt to introduce this practice known as proskinesis or prostration, because I think it dramatically illustrates the kinds of misgivings that his followers felt. And also, I might add, the way in which he himself was trying to engineer uh, court ritual. There is a story told on the question of obeisance, and it goes as follows. It had been agreed between Alexander and the sophists, the university professors in his retinue, and the most distinguished of the Persians and the Medes at his court, that the subject should be raised during a drinking party. So they've engineered this. They're, they're, they're setting the seeds for this occasion. Anaxarchus launched the topic saying that Alexander had much better claims to be regarded as a god than Dionysus and Heracles, not so much because of the number and magnitude of his achievements, as because Dionysus was a Theban and not related to the Macedonians, and Heracles was an Argive and was only distantly related. The Macedonians would have better reason to honor their king with divine honors. So Alexander and his in a circle, have decided to engineer a conversation at a dinner party to raise the topic of divine honors for Alexander. There was no doubt that once Alexander departed from men that he would be a god. How much more justifiable it would be, therefore, to honor him now, still while he was present among them as a man. After Anaxarchus had spoken to this effect, those who were privy to the plan praised his words and they wanted to begin prostrating themselves before Alexander. But the majority of the Macedonians were displeased with this and kept quiet. This is a fascinating incident. We've got an eyewitness here of the Macedonians standing back and thinking, what the hell is going on here? Does this man seriously think that we're going to treat him the way the Persians treat their gods? And so Callisthenes then intervened and said, I declare there is no honor, no honor fitting to a man that Alexander does not deserve, but a distinction has been drawn between men, excuse me, by men, between honors fit for mortals and honors fit for the gods. This is crossing the line from the point of view of many of the Greeks. So Callisthenes then goes forward and he tries to uh, resist this business of Alexander receiving obeisance. And then uh, some of the Persians actually come forward to perform the act of prostration. And uh, the Greeks actually laugh at them. They think that this is comic, the idea of actually performing prostration before Alexander. And so they burst out laughing, and Alexander once again becomes angry over the whole matter. Alexander now engineers an episode so that if the Greeks give him a kiss, they will then perform the obeisance to him. It's his way of saying, look, we're Greeks. Just give me a kiss and we'll carry on as usual. But this way, the Persian subjects will be pleased. Callisthenes apparently uh, went forward to make the obeisance, but, uh, uh, excuse me, went forward to get the kiss 
and failed to make the obeisance, and so Alexander refused him the kiss, at which he said, then I depart the poorer for a kiss. What these incidents, I think, reveal to us are that Alexander is trying to manipulate every aspect of court ritual in an attempt to fashion himself as someone higher than either the Greeks or the Persians. But all he succeeded in doing was aggravating the Greeks' misgivings about what they called his Orientalism. In fact, after Alexander's death, most of his successors would simply put aside these women, divorce them, and ignore these marriages. The Epigonoi, these Persians trained as Macedonians, were disbanded, and uh, none of the successors made any attempt to reconcile or to fuse Greeks and Persians. They simply imposed Hellenism, Greek culture, on their subject areas. So the dream of a kind of fusion between the two cultures really dies with Alexander. And that may be unfortunate or it may be inevitable, it's hard to say. Even after his conquest of Darius, though, Alexander's campaigns continued. We resume the story as he pushes his Macedonian army even further east. Now, what is left to gain, one has to ask here. The great king is dead. Alexander has taken over. He's won all of the great capitals of the Persian kings, Babylon, Susa, Persepolis, and so forth. And yet, Alexander keeps campaigning, driving his army further and further east. He takes them into the mountain passes of the Hindu Kush. He takes them up into Pakistan. He tries to attack a mountain ridge 7,000 feet above the Indus River, the area known to the Greeks as Aornos. And the principal reason that he does it, according to our ancient sources, is that Heracles had failed to do it. Now, I've tried to resist psychoanalyzing Alexander up until this point, but it does seem to me that in the final phase of his campaign, after he has won all that he can legitimately expect to win in conquering the Persians, we have to entertain the idea that Alexander has really taken on the notion seriously that he is a god and that he will now perform accomplishments and deeds that not only no man has ever accomplished before but not even a god has accomplished. So he keeps marching right into the Hindu Kush and then he comes back down towards the Indus and there he overtakes and conquers most of the local governors, men such as Taxiles and he even conquers the most powerful king of northwest India at the time, the king known as Porus. And frankly, he would have kept on going even further, across northern India, probably across Tibet and even into China, but for the fact that his army had had enough. Now, the popular story told of Alexander that he wept because there were no more empires to conquer is actually nonsense. Alexander didn't weep. He knew there were more empires to conquer and he wanted to go after them. But now I think we are really talking about a man driven by a kind of madness. To the Greeks, it was a pothos, as they called it, a yearning, a desire to go ever further beyond every pass and every mountain into every new territory. But his army wouldn't go any further. They'd had enough. They'd had enough of seeing him become more like uh, the Persian king they'd conquered. They'd had enough of seeing Persians brought into their army. They'd had enough of the training of young Persians. They'd had enough of prostration. And most of all, they'd had enough of marching east. Because by now, they'd been on the road for 11 years. Had conquered the empire and simply wanted to return and to enjoy the fruits of their victory. It is in the return from India that I think we really see the best evidence for what, frankly, we can call Alexander's megalomania. He had a fleet built, which was commanded by his general Nearchus, and which sailed along the northern coast of the Persian Gulf. How easy it would have been to have transported his army back that way, and to bring them quickly and safe and sound back to Babylon. But instead, he marched his army through the harshest desert regions he ever crossed at any time in his campaigns at a time when there were no more enemies to conquer except isolated towns in the southern Iranian desert, the area known as Gedrosia in antiquity. It really looks to me as if a spoilt man who has been cheated out of his 
uh, chance of further eastern conquest by his army is now in fact punishing them by marching them through the desert so that there are men going mad with thirst and even dying. And his disastrous return from the east then is only finally capped off by his own death of a fever in Babylon in 323 BC. Uh, a pathetic end, frankly, to what had been a great military career. But on the other hand, perhaps it's better that it did end at that point. Because though Alexander was a great general, we have little evidence that he was a great commander, a king of a region. His policy of administration was essentially a duplication of the Persian system. And often, he simply left the same men in charge of a region that he'd conquered who'd been there before him. He may have wanted to even go further west and take on the Carthaginians. We'll never know because he died before any of these plans could be put into operation. But I think the final lesson from Alexander is that for a great general such as him, it was much easier to wage war than it was to rule a kingdom. Welcome back to our series of lectures on the Hellenistic Age. We've been looking at the career of Alexander the Great, the blazing star who, in the course of 11 years, totally transformed the size of the area of Greek culture and introduced Greek culture to a region that extended as far east as the Hindu Kush and northwest India, ushering in this 300 years of political change as Greeks ruled through much of the Middle East and a cultural uh, epoch that lasted even longer following the Roman subjugation of the Eastern Mediterranean. We've observed that this entire epoch really is the creation of one man in a single 11-year campaign, and yet curiously, the Alexander we've been examining in some respects is an ambiguous character, almost schizophrenic. Because on the one hand, we've been looking at an Alexander who seems to dream of fusing Greeks and Persians together to create a new ruling elite. We've seen a man who engages in these banquets of reconciliation, of trying to get his men to marry Persian women and to create even physically a new ruling mixed group of Greeks and Persians. And on the other hand, we seem to have someone not so much a visionary so much as a megalomaniac, a man so intoxicated with his own power that he even came to believe the stories of his divinity, stories which may have grown up in the realm of court titles such as Son of Ammon, but which were taken up seriously by Alexander. Did he promote these ideas merely as a way of fusing his two ruling groups, as seems to be the case when he introduced prostration? Or did he really believe it? So that he grew increasingly, frankly, insane. So that by the end of his career, he was punishing his men by pushing them over the Gadrosian Desert when they could have sailed back to Babylon. The career and the accomplishments of Alexander have always been subject to widely different interpretations because the data that we have seems so contradictory. To some, he has appeared as an idealist, someone attempting to create, frankly, a new world order in which Greeks and non-Greeks would live together in harmony. And to others, he's a drunk, a despot, an autocrat, someone whose unbridled power corrupted a weak character and who was driven by nothing more than an endless appetite for further and further conquest, much, in fact, as his father had been before him. And so history gives us really two very different Alexanders. Alexander the megalomaniac, Alexander the altruist. I'd like to explore these two interpretations a little further for a moment. The most positive interpretation of Alexander, the notion that Alexander is really trying to create something new, uh, comes from a British historian, W. W. Tan, who, writing in the aftermath of World War I and at the time of the League of Nations, a time, in other words, when internationally we were playing with the idea of finishing war and living in unity and harmony together, Tan introduced the notion, based, I think, on these contemporary ideas, that Alexander's empire was an ancient forerunner, if you will. 
in the 20th century's experiment in international cooperation. So for Tan, the banquet at Opus, which we've been talking about, where Greeks and Persians sat together and drank from the same cup and uh, offered a toast to, to unity and harmony, becomes the unity and harmony of all mankind. Tan speaks about Alexander actually seeking to transcend national differences. And quite explicitly, Tan likens Alexander to someone like St. Paul, who uh, famously remarked on one occasion, there are no Greeks and barbarians. In other words, there are no distinctions between different national groups, between different ethnicities. So that's the highly altruistic view of Alexander that we get in the work of some 20th century historians, particularly Tan. But at the other end of the scale, you'll find other interpretations of Alexander, particularly in the work of Ernst Badian, an ancient historian at Harvard, for whom Alexander is frankly nothing more than yet another example of the paranoid, power-hungry tyrant that has afflicted us throughout history. An ancient Napoleon or an ancient Hitler cast in exactly the same way, in exactly the same mold. In, in Badian's view, Alexander, the paranoid tyrant, is continually engaged in conspiracies, finding conspiracies against him, which he then weeds out, leading to assassinations and executions, relentlessly driving his troops forward in his maniacal and bloody quest for personal glory, no matter what the cost to innocent victims, including his own men. And frankly, there is a certain amount of material in the sources about Alexander that really does confirm this line of interpretation. We know of leading Macedonian nobles such as Philotas and Parmenio who were summarily executed by Alexander, the hallmark of a tyrant afraid that some other power grouping might emerge in his court to challenge his own supreme power. We know in another instance of uh, someone exposing what they called the pages plot, a group of young boys at the court, the wine bearers and cup bearers, who were supposedly engaged in a plot to assassinate Alexander. And all of them are executed on the basis of very flimsy evidence. So we seem to have some evidence for this kind of uh, maniacal uh, character at work in Alexander. Probably the best known instance, and one that I'd like to uh, share with you, is a story told by the historian Arian that involves a character from Alexander's court named Clitus. Uh, there are two Macedonian officers of this name. This one is called Clitus the Black. And he was a general who'd served with Alexander. He'd been through all the campaigns, and he wasn't particularly impressed with the kind of orientalizing style of the new Macedonian court. And so we read of a feast in honor of the god Dionysus. And it was Alexander's custom to offer sacrifice at this feast of Dionysus every year on the sacred day of the festival. On this particular occasion, the Macedonians, as is usual, end up having a drinking party afterwards. And on this occasion, Alexander, for some reason best known to himself, sacrificed not to Dionysus, but to Castor and Pollux the so-called Dioscoroi, to somewhat lesser Greek gods. There had been some pretty heavy drinking. Another innovation, says Arian, in drink, too. He now tended to barbaric excess. He seems to be drinking more as the campaigns go on. And in the course of talk, the subject of the Dioscoroi came up, together with the common attribution of their parentage to Zeus instead of Tyndareus. Here's an interesting topic of conversation while the Macedonians are drinking. These semi-divine figures, they weren't really the sons of a human, they were the sons of a god. Do we hear a theme here? Yes. The theme of the great man who may become a god. This is probably why Alexander introduces this topic of conversation. Now we know already, we've seen in earlier lectures, that Alexander is sometimes surrounded by men who are all too willing to play the sycophant, to play up to him. Some of the company, the sort of people whose sycophantic tongues always have been and always will be the bane of kings, declared with gross flattery that in their opinion, Castor and Pollux were not to be compared with Alexander and his accomplishments, 
Others, being thoroughly drunk, extended the invidious comparison to Heracles himself. So we have yet another one of these set pieces where the Macedonians are drinking, and instead of the conversation following its normal tone, someone introduces the idea of Alexander being greater than the heroes and gods that have gone before. And as people drink and the whole thing starts to get more inflamed, the Macedonians who resist this idea get more and more angry. And so we read, now Clitus, for some time past, had obviously deprecated the change in Alexander. He didn't like what Alexander was becoming. He liked neither his move towards the manners of the East nor the sycophantic expressions of his courtiers. When, therefore, he had heard what was said on this occasion, he too had been drinking heavily, he angrily intervened. So a major Macedonian general stands up and he says, this is nonsense. It was intolerable, he declared, to offer such an insult to divine beings. And he would not allow anyone to pay Alexander a compliment at the expense of the mighty ones of long ago. This is good traditional Greek piety saying, come on, hold up. In any case, he continued, Alexander was deeply hurt by this. And what happens next is that Alexander grabs a sword and he runs Clytus through, killing him on the spot in a drunken rage. Now we've had, we've had echoes of this right back to the very beginning of Alexander's reign when he drew his sword on Philip as well at the moment of the wedding feast involving the daughter of Attalus. And so we seem to have this recurring theme of the drunkard. In fact, one interpretation of Alexander has simply suggested he was an alcoholic. But we have this version of Alexander increasingly giving in to drink and increasingly giving in to these fantasies of divine power and eventually even killing in cold blood, in manslaughter, there at the court, one of his senior generals. Now, how on earth are we to reconcile these two competing views of Alexander? It's very difficult. And it's very difficult because these views of Alexander go right back to antiquity to the different and separate traditions about him. The first tradition we'll call the court tradition. This is the sanitized view of Alexander. Alexander as the great man, the man, as Aristotle would say, of megalopsuche, great spirit. And this is the version of Alexander that was written up for him by the official court historian. Alexander, like Napoleon, had a whole retinue of intellectuals along with him, and one of them kept a daily record of events and then wrote them up in the grand inflated style of contemporary history writing. His name was Callisthenes, he was a student of Aristotle, and he reported on the campaign day by day as it progressed. Now, Callisthenes eventually would in fact fall out with Alexander and would be executed, but he lived long enough to produce a highly eulogistic account of the great man. And it is to that tradition, close to the court itself, that we have all these stories. It is to that tradition that we owe the stories of Alexander presenting himself as a Homeric hero, like Achilles, and being compared with Dionysus and Heracles. So in this court tradition, Alexander was heroic, he was semi-divine, and he was always right. And of course, other, fo other writers followed this tradition as well. Two of the men who marched with Alexander, Ptolemy, who eventually would establish his kingdom in Egypt, and Aristobulus, one of the engineers who was along with uh, Alexander, both wrote memoirs. And of course, it was in the interests of men who'd marched with Alexander and who probably loved Alexander dearly to also present him as this larger-than-life figure who had transformed the world with his godlike campaign. And it is to this tradition that we owe the theme that we see in so much of the sources about Alexander of his yearning pothos, as the Greeks call it. He conceives a desire to go to Siwa. He conceives a desire to capture the rock of Aornos. He conceives a desire to campaign against King Poros. Alexander in this tradition is being led on by some vague and unidentifiable yearning which seems to come from heaven, as if some spirit is actually uh, ordaining his campaigns. But on the other side, there was, even in antiquity, this very negative tradition about Alexander as well. 
And it is this tradition that emphasizes the passion that drove uh, and motivated Alexander, the bloodshed of Alexander's reign as he increasingly resorts to executions. The first author who's associated with this view of Alexander is called Clitarchus. And although his work was hated by the critics, it was loved by the general populace. And it became immensely popular reading during the Hellenistic period and even later into the Roman Empire as well. The Alexander that Clitarchus portrayed in his work was an Alexander who flew into rages, would kill someone in a drunken brawl, and then would be remorseful for three days, lying prostrate on his back in his tent, hidden from view. It's this tradition that gives us the Alexander who killed Clytus the Black in the episode I just read. And it's this colorful tradition that con uh, continues and comes down to us in the works of historians such as Diodorus uh, Siculus and Justin, the later Roman historian. Now, eventually these two traditions would become merged in later antiquity, in the first century BC, the first and second centuries AD. Historians were reading whatever they could about Alexander's work, seeing whatever was in the library. And so we find that the later historians, men like Plutarch and men like Arian, who give us some of our fullest accounts of Alexander's reign, are actually trying to marry two traditions uh, together. The core tradition, which gives us Alexander's pothos, his semi-divine yearning for further conquest, and the Vulgate, or the popular tradition, which gives us stories such as Alexander being visited by the Queen of the Amazons. So these later historians were often confronted with a choice. They would read these stories and they would have to say, now, is this reliable or is this popular fiction? Is this romantic nonsense? And fortunately, some of the better historians would actually evaluate these stories and say, this story is probably not true, though they would usually tell you anyway, since it made interesting reading. These conflicting traditions of Alexander are never fully reconciled. And in fact, Alexander finally becomes much greater than the record of his original campaign. He continues to influence the Middle East, the Mediterranean world, the Near East, long after his death because his accomplishments are simply so monumental, so off the scale, that no ordinary history can do them justice. We're going to be examining the changes that are wrought in uh, the Mediterranean world by the Greeks and by the Macedonian control of the Hellenistic world. But before we go into the details of those changes in history, we should leave Alexander as the figure of romance and myth, greater even than the story of his accomplishments. Because Alexander becomes for the ancient world and even for the Middle Ages, a figure like King Arthur exerting an enormous influence over an entire culture and over a vast area, even longer than the duration of the Hellenistic Commonwealth, or the Oikumene, as the Greeks called it, even longer than that, Alexander, as a figure of myth and story, survived. These stories, both based on the historian's accounts in the court tradition, and also in the Vulgate tradition, and then increasingly stories added from local traditions are all brought together in a work known as the Alexander Legend. Now this dates probably to about the 3rd century AD. It's first written in Greek and it's attributed, incorrectly, to Callisthenes. It's not actually by him, it's by a later author, and so it's sometimes called the work of Pseudo-Callisthenes. And fairly shortly after it's produced in the 3rd century AD, it's then translated into Latin. And in Greek and Latin, it is distributed throughout all regions of the Roman Empire. The Greek-speaking East, it makes its way to Byzantium. It is never forgotten in the Greek tradition. The Greeks today will tell you stories about Alexander the Great. And in the West, it is translated into Latin. And from there, it makes its way to France and to Germany and to England. And so we find Alexander turning up all around uh, both Europe and Central Asia as well. One version of this, for example, is the Askandanama, the, the saga or the epic of Iskander, Alexander, as he's known in the East. And some details of that will illustrate for you, I think, the magical quality of Alexander. Because in the As Iskandanama, Alexander actually becomes a Muslim.
despite the fact that Islam is not established until about 900 years after the death of the historical Alexander. Nevertheless, he is a good Muslim. He is actually the son of Darab, obviously the Persian king's name, Darius, now transformed. And according to this version of events, Alexander is not really the son of a king from the West, who in this version is known as Philcus, clearly Philip, transformed, who is known as the Caesar of Rum, which is the generic term used in the East for the entire Greek and Roman world of the Mediterranean. So in this version of the story, virtually every detail that you can imagine about Alexander has either been ignored or inverted. He's not a Greek. Uh, he comes from a thousand years later, and he's actually really the son of a good Muslim king, Persian and Muslim. It's an extraordinary appropriation of the historical Alexander, and that is what is going to continue with uh, the story of Alexander ever afterwards. One of the interesting details of the Iskandarnama that I want to draw to your attention is that throughout that work of the Epic of Alexander, he's often referred to by an expression which translates into English as the two-horned one. And historians, I think, have reliably explained this term because on the coins of Alexander, his picture, his portrait, was shown in profile and in that profile was shown not just his head and his royal diadem and his curly hair, but also a horn coming out of his forehead, representing Zeus Amon. So that on his coins, Alexander was minting images of himself to look like Zeus Amon. And that image survived long after Alexander was dead and gone. Those coins remained in circulation for hundreds of years. People would hoard coins and keep them. I mean, gold was really valuable. So these coins survived for hundreds of years. And we have to imagine a point later on where some Persian poet, in t telling the story of Iskander, Alexander, sees one of these coins and, wondering about those, ho those horns, calls him the double-horned one, as if it is some mark of his kingship and his divinity, probably not even aware of the fact that these horns had originated with Zeus Amon and with a particular moment in Alexander's self-presentation and ideology during his own career. Eventually, this story of Alexander, this romantic figure, will reach as far away as Britain in the West and Yemen, Sri Lanka, and even Northwest India uh, in, the, uh, in the East. In various versions of the Alexander legend, Alexander will, in the Alexander romance, as it really should be called, Alexander will be a Russian, he will be a Serbian prince, he will be a Goth, and he'll be a Saxon. So any ethnic group, essentially, from about 300 BC through to the Renaissance, at some point is likely to claim Alexander for themselves. Alexander's accomplishments had been so astonishing that he himself came to stand for some kind of superhuman status that took him beyond the realm of the normal. And it's for this reason that Alexander, in the medieval West at least, and in some of the Greek stories as well, becomes associated with two particular episodes that you should know about. The first is the story of Alexander ascending into heaven. Alexander in these versions of the Alexander Romance is a good Christian, but he is also so powerful and so wondrous that he's able to do what no man has done before him and to approach heaven. How? Well, very cunningly, he grabs a couple of griffins, that is, eagle-headed lions, flying eagle-headed lions. He chains them up and starves them for a couple of days until they become so hungry that they will eat anything. He then chains them to a basket, and he holds above the basket a stick that contains the liver of a dead beast. The griffins, in their eagerness to get to the liver and to eat, start flapping their wings and fly up, and thus does Alexander ascend into the heavens only to be greeted by an angel who points out to him that it would be arrogant and wrong for a good Christian king to try to make himself the equal of heaven. Alexander acquiesces and peacefully returns to earth. So Alexander here, the, the scale of his, his accomplishments to the east has now been transformed into accomplishments going up, literally out of this world, into the heavens. And the other area where humans in antiquity would like to have gone but weren't able to explore was, of course, the deep sea. You probably didn't know that Alexander invented the first diving bell. 
according to medieval traditions in the Alexander Romance. It was Alexander who created a glass sphere in which he put various animals, uh, a cock so that its crowing would tell him when it was daytime, even in the depths when it was too dark to see, and a cat whose breathing it was believed would purify the air, and a dog which he took with him because if he ran into trouble and had to escape he would kill the dog knowing that the sea will not maintain dead bodies within it but will spew them out. And so Alexander in this way and because he was actually betrayed and was left at the bottom of the sea was able to get back uh, to the seashore once again. These stories give you some idea of what Alexander means to people. He represents what cannot be accomplished by normal human beings. He comes to stand for the superhuman in every age after the Hellenistic period. It's not surprising, therefore, that leaders, real men seeking to present themselves as great commanders, would always present themselves in the style of Alexander. Julius Caesar would do it. Augustus would do it. Later kings would do it as well. One of the most uh, telling, I think, examples of this use of the Alexander story and the image of Alexander comes with uh, Pope Paul III, who, before he was elevated to the pontificate, was actually known as Alexander. This was his given name. And while most of his opponents were decorating their Roman villas with stories taken from the glories of Rome's past, he decorated uh, the Sala Paulina, the, the Pauline chamber, his inner sanctum, with pictures showing Alexander the Great. In other words, this was the heroic figure of the past that this Alexander, Pope Paul, wanted to liken himself to. So Alexander has become a mythical figure much greater than even his original accomplishments. And there's one last story from the Alexander Romance that I want to leave you with because once again it, it conveys I think this idea of Alexander representing the unattainable in human life. If Alexander went further, higher and deeper than any other human being, he also nearly succeeded where no other man had succeeded and that is in capturing immortality. He actually did find the plant of immortal life, you perhaps didn't know this, and he entrusted it to his sister, but she lost it. And in her remorse she threw herself overboard and dropped to the bottom of the sea where she was transformed into a mermaid, what the Greeks called the Gorgona. And whenever you find yourself sailing at sea and a storm arises, you must recognize that the reason for that storm is that the Gorgona, Alexander's sister, is in turmoil. And invariably at some point during that storm, she's going to appear out of the water holding the boat in her hand. And she's going to give you an opportunity either to sail on safely to harbor or else she's going to destroy you. The question she's going to ask you is, does Alexander still live and rule the world? And you better know what the answer is. Because if you say the wrong thing, she's going to shipwreck you. The answer, of course, is, ne, yes. O Alexandros Omegas, Alexander the Great, zi que vezelevi ton cosmon. Alexander the Great, yes, lives and rules the world still today. The story of the Gorgon demonstrates, I think, rather beautifully the way in which Alexander has ascended to the realm of myth. He has become a figure so much larger than life because of his unparalleled accomplishments that he came to stand in later ages for all those quests for what could never be attained, such as immortality. And it's true that the distance that he covered opened up a new world to the Greeks. Though he would not live to see it, thousands of Greeks would pour out of mainland Greece, moving east, first into Asia Minor and then later into Syria and right across into what is modern day Ir Iran and Afghanistan. So he changed the face of the world, but I don't want to leave you with Alexander, the figure of myth, the superhuman Alexander. I think we need to try and summarize this man as more of a mere mortal. For me, charting a course between Alexander the megalomaniac and Alexander the altruist, Alexander emerges as in some ways a normal man. Oh yes, he was a genius as a military strategist. He was a great general, no doubt. 
But when he set out at the beginning of his career, did he really have any other aim than simply to repeat what his father had done? Namely, to fight as many wars as he could and to conquer as much territory as he could. He's very much like Philip, expressing the same Macedonian notion of conquering wherever one can, filling the vacuum and extending one's own territorial conquest. That's a very limited aim to begin with. And because of his own successes and the rapidity with which he did overwhelm the Persians, he was then faced with a vastly greater challenge. That is, to find some way of ruling over an empire, ruling an empire vastly bigger than anything the Greeks could ever have imagined. Now, to those people who think of him as a megalomaniac, the record shows nothing more than the loneliness of supreme power, a man who never came to grips with that task. But I would suggest instead that what we see is a very mortal man, a great general, but a mortal man, trying to respond to the challenge of this new age by devising a new plan for the world that would follow. He failed because his generals didn't repeat the plan. But it wasn't because of his madness and it wasn't even because of uh, unavoidable cultural differences between Greeks and Persians. I'd suggest to you that it was simply a matter of time. Alexander campaigned for 11 years and died. Augustus ruled for 40 years and transformed the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire with himself as the first emperor. So I'll leave you with this thought. It may well be that Alexander's failure was not that he didn't have a vision for the future or that he wasn't equipped to make that vision become reality. He simply ran out of time. When Alexander died in Babylon in 323 BC, there also died with him the dream of a united empire of Greeks and Persians. We've already seen that Alexander had been trying to reconcile two systems that fundamentally could not be reconciled. On the one hand, there was a Persian system which was hierarchically organized and required at its apex a king ordained by heaven, a great king to whom you prostrated yourself. And on the other hand, there was a Macedonian system in which the king was the leader of a band of essentially equal nobles. Alexander's officers were utterly uninterested in trying to continue the experiment in fusion that he had initiated. And I've suggested that Alexander's failure was probably not due to any irreparable difference between the cultures, but quite simply to the fact that he died after campaigning for 11 years, but before being allowed to rule that empire for any length of time. And I compared him, for example, to Augustus, who effected a transformation in the Roman world, largely because he continued to rule for 40 years. But instead of there being a united Greco-Persian monarchy or ruling elite running the empire, instead the generation after Alexander's death saw the entire Eastern Mediterranean and much of the Near East plunged into a paralyzingly difficult to follow round of civil wars, wars fought by one Macedonian general against another, extending for 30 years and embracing all of the region that Alexander had just conquered and annexed for the Macedonians. It is, in fact, the most depressing coda to the brilliant career of Alexander that one can imagine. As his generals clustered around his dead body in Babylon and carved up his empire like jackals around a carcass. And so what I want to look at today is the issue of how that round of warfare worked itself out and what kind of political order emerged from that, since it was clearly not going to be anything like the earlier Macedonian kingship or the dream that Alexander had had for his empire. First of all, I think we need to understand why it is that his officers resisted so strongly the kind of dream, the kind of vision of the future that Alexander had offered by trying to merge Greeks and Persians. Why, would so, why were they so resistant to the notion of power sharing or of creating a new elite? The reason, I think, is that his generals were not merely subjects. They called themselves his philoi, in other words, 
his friends. They regarded themselves as being, in many ways, his equals, even though, of course, they had not led the campaign that he had. But you must remember that many of the generals and the leading soldiers in that army were men, in fact, of Philip II's generation, men who were 20 or 30 years older than Alexander. And these men were uninterested in the idea of sharing power with the Persians. Among the nobility in Macedon, there existed a strongly egalitarian ideology. The king was king not by divine right, but because of his preeminence. That is why Alexander had always had to be the first man over the wall, the first man into the breach, the first man on the attack. Because he was the first among peers. And just as the king ate and drank among his peers, we've seen many of the stories already of Alexander drinking with his other generals, so too they fought as equals. And this notion of equality is evoked even by the names of the battalions within the Macedonian army, so that the elite cavalry is called the companion cavalry. Companions of the king, companions of each other, equals in the game of war. And the elite battalion in the infantry was known technically as the pedzatyroi, which means the foot companions. Again, men who proclaimed that they could stand shoulder to shoulder in battle with the Macedonian king. For these men who proved their valour by defeating the great king and his armies, Persia was not a noble adversary to be treated as an equal, but rather a conquered empire. It was booty to be carved up the way a carcass is carved up after it has been hunted down and slaughtered. Alexander was the glue that kept the Macedonian world together. This entire enterprise of taking Macedonian power out way beyond anywhere the Greeks had ever gone before. It was him, it was he, I should say, who was at the very centre of all this. And with his death, the Macedonians were confronted by a paralyzing void. In fact, you could go so far as to say that just about every bad condition or circumstance imaginable conspired to occur upon the death of Alexander. Consider these factors, for example. When Alexander died, his queen, his, his, his wife Roxanne, was pregnant. Now, the complication here is obvious. It is not clear for a start that she is going to bring the child to term and that a child will be born. It could be stillborn or it could die in the womb. If she does bear a child, there is uh, no guarantee that it's going to be a boy who will have a claim to the throne. It could have been a girl. No one could predict at Alexander's death whether the pregnant Roxanne would have a girl and the Macedonians had never put a queen on the throne. So that was left in doubt. And quite frankly, even if at some future point she were to give birth to a boy, there is no way that he would be in a position to assert his authority, and that's what makes a Macedonian king a king, not his blood, but his authority. He wouldn't be able to assert it for at least another 16 years. So Alexander's death had left the Macedonians in limbo without any clear indication of who was going to be the next king and who would have legitimate authority. And quite frankly, even if the child were born and grew up and eventually uh, were to be recognized as a stout commander and a, a good general, he wouldn't even be a purely born Macedonian or even Greco-Macedonian because his mother, Roxanne, was from Bactria, out in the, the upper uh, eastern satrapies of the former Persian Empire. Who knows? In 20 years' time, the Macedonians might be saying, we don't want a posthumous bastard ruling over us if he's not even Macedonian and Greek. So that was massively complicated, and it really paralyzed the negotiations upon Alexander's death. There was a second great complication. During all the negotiations between the Macedonian generals, the jockeying for power that took place after Alexander's death, the common belief, the assumption that every general made was that it was they, the Macedonian elite, the generals of Alexander's army, who would have the final say. So that we hear of negotiations involving Perdiccas, Ptolemy I, Lysimachus, Seleucus, these great men who had led the Macedonians in battle. And they bargained with each other and negotiated with each other and they completely ignored one other important factor in the negotiations. That is, that the Macedonian king 
was to be acclaimed by the Macedonian state. And the Macedonian state here in Babylon was the army, not the generals and the officers, the ordinary men who'd fought for Alexander. Now these men not only were committed to Alexander, but they were committed to the bloodline of his family. They wanted someone related to Alexander to be on the throne. And they had a candidate, and they put him forward. The candidate's name was Aridaeus. He was the older half-brother of Alexander. And according to all accounts, it's hard to test this, but according to all accounts, there was something wrong with him. He may have been mentally defective. Uh, he may have some debilitating disease, some dreadful form of epilepsy. We don't really know what it was. Of course, there were stories in antiquity that Olympias had poisoned him when he was a child to clear the way to the throne for her son, Alexander, but we don't know. What we can say is this. Alexander had carefully ensured that no competitor to the throne who had royal blood stayed alive when he himself, Alexander, became king. And the fact that Philip Aridaeus, Aridaeus now as king was called Philip, the fact that Philip Aridaeus was still alive must suggest that he was regarded by the rest of the Macedonian nobility as physically incapable of serving as king. Now exactly what the nature of the disability was we don't know. But while all the negotiations were going on between Perdiccas and Ptolemy and Seleucus and the rest of these generals, there in the tent right next to them was Aridaeus, who they'd ignored and overlooked. And it was he who the Macedonian soldiers said, we want as king. The army threatened to go into revolt and to rebel completely from the entire officer corps. And all of these high-ranking generals were forced simply to accept the fact that Alexander the Great was now going to be succeeded by an unborn fetus and a half-wit older half-brother. That's what the Macedonian Empire was put into the hands of. Now, the period that follows Alexander's death and the elevation of Philip Aridaeus and finally then the, the birth of Alexander's son, who would uh, be called Alexander IV, the period after this, from 323 down to the end of the century, virtually the last quarter of the 4th century BC, is essentially a period during which the various great generals of Alexander's army jockeyed for position in relation to each other, forming alliances, fighting against common enemies in an attempt to secure their own power, and in two cases, in an attempt to re-establish the unity of Alexander's empire. So what I want to look at now is the record of these campaigns, despite the fact that the detail is often difficult to follow, because I want to chart the course by which the two men who had a chance of unifying Alexander's empire failed and how out of the void of that failure was created a new political order, namely the political order of the Hellenistic Age. The first of the men to try to unify the empire of Alexander was Perdiccas. Perdiccas had served as his vizier, as his prime minister, if you like, after the death of Alexander's close friend Hephaestion, and he was the natural person to take over the reins of power. While negotiations were going on at Babylon, it was Perdiccas who had made sure that in the tent where the generals did their trading, Alexander's ring and scepter were there on a throne looming over all of these negotiations. And at Babylon, in the first round of negotiations between the Hellenistic uh, generals, he found himself in a very powerful position because he had command of Alexander's army and he possessed the two new kings in his entourage. It was he who took over as a guardian for Philip Aridaeus and for the now infant child, uh, Alexander IV. So he had a shot. He had a real shot at keeping Alexander's dream alive of keeping the empire in the control of this family with himself as the power behind the throne or perhaps, who knows, even asserting himself as the new king of Alexander's empire. But Perdiccas's power evaporated almost immediately because in the very first year after the generals had divided up Alexander's empire, 
as each of them went off to their various provinces, their satrapies as they were called, to take over, Perdiccas made the decision to attack Egypt. Now Egypt was the province that had been taken over by Ptolemy. Ptolemy, one of Alexander's bodyguards, one of his generals, now one of his most uh, successful uh, followers, had had himself appointed as satrap of Egypt. Satrap, provincial governor, in effect he was truly the independent ruler. He continued to put up monuments and to issue decrees in the name of Philip Aridaeus and Alexander IV, the Macedonian kings, but the true power was certainly in Ptolemy's hands. And Egypt had been a cunning choice because it was an area that was virtually self-contained. It was hard to attack from the east because of desert, hard to attack from the west because of desert, hard to attack from the north because of the delta, and hard to attack from the south because of the river and because of the, the cataracts of the Nile. So he'd cut off a hunk of Alexander's empire that he could hang on to on his own. But Perdiccas wanted to dislodge him. Why? Perdiccas, surely with the Macedonian kings in tow, was heading back to Macedon and he couldn't afford to leave this powerful independent ruler behind him ready to attack. And so he headed uh, towards Egypt, but just as he was on the point of crossing over the Nile, his army went into revolt against him and he was, Perdiccas, was cut down by his own men. Almost certainly the men who cut him down had been bribed by Ptolemy. So the round of warfare between these Macedonian generals had moved into its next phase. With Perdiccas dead, with the one man who had control of the army and control of the kings dead, the various generals of Alexander's army met again, this time in Syria at a site called Tree Paradisos. And we have an account of the meeting between these various generals. I'll read you a short segment of it because I think it gives a very graphic illustration of the mindset of these men and how they were treating Alexander's domains. Antipater, who was the regent of Macedon, in his turn carried out a distribution of provinces. So he's divvying up the empire, partly confirming the previous arrangements of Babylon in 323 and partly modifying them. Now listen to just some of the names. These names are going to run throughout the rest of this course. These are going to be the, the founders of the great dynasties of the Hellenistic world. They begin here as Alexander's generals being awarded satrapies or provinces which will mutate into kingdoms. Ptolemy was, was to control Egypt, Libya, and all the expansive territory beyond it. Syria was entrusted to Laomedon. Philoxenos he appointed to Cilicia. Of the upper satrapies, he assigned Mesopotamia to Amphimachus. To Seleucus, he gave Babylon. That's going to be an important name. And then here's an interesting detail. Antigenes, who had been the first to attack Perdiccas and who commanded the Macedonian silver shields, was granted the rule over the whole of Susiana. What's happening here is that these men have quite literally sat down with a map of the old Persian Empire. These maps existed specifying particular satrapies and they have simply traded with each other saying, okay, you get Egypt, you get Babylon, you get Susa. Jackals round a carcass. According to this arrangement at Tree Paradisos in 321, the two kings, Philip Aridaeus and Alexander IV, were escorted home back to Macedon by Antipater, who remained regent. Ptolemy kept control, as we saw, of Egypt, Seleucus getting Babylon. But the most important character, the most powerful man to emerge in this round of warfare between the various forces, was a man by the name of Antigonus, who was made satrap of Asia. Now, Antigonus is one of the rom most romantic figures in the Hellenistic period. He was from Philip's generation, older than Alexander. So, while Alexander dies as a young man around 30, Antigonus, we have to imagine here, is a man of about 50 or 60. And he continued to campaign for the next 10 years or so, even though he'd lost one eye and was known as Antigonus the One-Eyed. A tremendously vigorous campaigner. Between 320 and 311 BC, after Tree Paradisos and for the next decade, Antigonus's power was so great that he was immediately opposed by an alliance of the other Hellenistic kings. Ptolemy in Egypt, Seleucus in Babylon, Lysimachus in Thrace, and Cassander who had taken over in Macedon after the death of his father Antipater. 
These men would reach a peace settlement in 311 BC and the terms of the settlement reflect the status quo which had emerged over the course of that last decade, a decade that had been marked by virtually continuous warfare. And this status quo of great power blocks competing with each other, always aligning whenever one ruler became more powerful than the others, was to be really the legacy of Alexander's successors. Intermittent, yet virtually continuous warfare between great dynastic and regional blocks. The issue of ruling an empire in the early Hellenistic age was always going to be subordinated to the more pressing issue of acquiring or securing the empire. External warfare, foreign policy, dealing with the other successors of Alexander, successors, not successors, dealing with these other successors, these other generals, these would be the driving concerns of a generation of Macedonian generals. So that for them, the question of the internal organization of their kingdoms, for example, uh, the relationship between ruler and ruled, would be worked out in a completely haphazard fashion. They had no plan for, for rule at all because they were always more concerned uh, with the others. For the first generation, at least, the new rulers of the Hellenistic world were uninterested in any questions of Greek culture and its fusion with non-Greek culture because they were too busy trying to kill each other. By 310 BC, the political landscape of Alexander's empire had assumed the shape that it would keep throughout the rest of the Hellenistic era. That is to say, major kingdoms were emerging, though the title was not yet used. The Ptolemies controlled Egypt, the Seleucids held Syria and Babylon, Macedon remained a separate region which would be ruled first by Antipater's son Cassander and later would be controlled by another dynasty while the Antigonids controlled most of Asia Minor. So these four or five major power blocks will be the essential political shape of the early Hellenistic period. Even so, the rulers here, these great men, were still ruling nominally as governors of territory conquered by Alexander. The decisive step in the final transformation of these territories into kingdoms came in 310 BC, because it was in that year that the last blood of Alexander finally died. His son, Alexander IV, was killed, and that event cleared the way for these generals to assert their independent authority as kings. We have a description of this in Diodorus and clearly we see, if you consider the dates, 310, Alexander had died in 323, his child is now about 13 years of age, he's getting close to the age, in about three years he'll be 16, the same age Alexander was when he fought on the left wing at Chironia. This child is just at the point of entering adolescence and becoming a man. And that's a problem, because now we'll have a real and viable successor to Alexander. So here are the circumstances. In that peace treaty of the various Hellenistic rulers uh, in 311, Cassander, Ptolemy and Lysimachus put an end to the war against Antigonus and they concluded a treaty. It was specified in it that Cassander should be general of Europe until Alexander, Roxanne's son, would come of age. And Lysimachus should be master of Thrace, Ptolemy master of Egypt and the neighboring cities of Libya and Arabia. Antigonus would have command of Asia while the Greeks would be autonomous. So this is the usual Hellenistic division of power that we've already seen on at least two earlier occasions. Nevertheless, they failed to abide by this agreement, says Diodorus, and each of them put forward fair pretexts and sought to increase their power. And now we get to the important clause. Cassander, Antipater's son, saw that Alexander IV, the son of Roxanne and Alexander the Great, was growing up. And there were some who were spreading the word in Macedon that one ought to release the boy from custody and hand him over and hand over to him his father's kingdom. So the critical moment has come. That posthumous heir is now ready to become king. Afraid for his own safety,
Cassandra instructed Glaukias, who, in who was in charge of the boy's custody, to assassinate Roxanne and the king and to conceal their bodies, though eventually news did creep out of what had happened. Philip Aridaeus, the older imbecile, had been killed in another round of these wars some seven years earlier, so that from 310 BC there was now no longer anyone of the blood of Alexander to sit on the throne of Macedon. So we're facing a void. There is no king of Macedon of that blood when it is that kingship which has defined all of these emerging territories. The final stage really will come almost as an anticlimax only four years later. And I must read you the description of this because the anticlimax is itself quite amusing. This is how Ptolemy, Seleucus and the other generals became kings. Listen to this. It's from Plutarch's life of one of these generals named Demetrius. The multitude then for the first time proclaimed Antigonus and Demetrius kings. They had just won a battle off the coast of Cyprus against the navy of Ptolemy. Antigonus' friends tied at once a diadem around his head, while Demetrius was sent a diadem by his father and addressed as king in a letter he wrote. When the news was reported, now listen to this, this is really astonishing. When the news was reported, Ptolemy's followers in Egypt also proclaimed Ptolemy king to dispel any impression that his defeat had humbled his pride. There, there, Ptolemy, don't feel badly. Oh, by the way, now you're a king. This is how he's acclaimed. And so emulation spread the practice like a contagion among the successors. Lysimachus began to wear the diadem. Seleucus began to uh, style himself as king. And Cassander uh, wrote to the others and said they should address him as king as well. So it's a slightly pathetic uh, expression, if you will, of what's happened at the end of the... Uh, the fourth century. Because of a naval victory, two guys call themselves king and the rest of the people follow suit so that nobody will be too depressed. Perhaps they had issues of self-esteem. Kings. Kings of what? They're not kings of Macedon. Ptolemy's not in Macedon. Seleucus is in Babylon. So what are they kings of? The answer finally doesn't matter. The idea that you were a king of a specific kingdom no longer even made any sense to the Greeks of this period. Instead, this notion of kingship was not associated with a territory, but only with the personality of a man. He was king because of his accomplishments. Ptolemy's men said they didn't want him to be disheartened because of the defeat of victory, so they too acclaimed him king. Not because he had control of Egypt, simply because of himself. So the origins of this kingship don't lie in the control of a particular territory, but rather in the acclamation of a king by his people. So there were no constitutional guidelines for the formation of these Hellenistic kingdoms. They'd emerged piecemeal from the wars between Alexander's successors. And the only qualification that one needed to be a king in this new age was charismatic leadership success in battle, being able to rally your troops. And it is this new notion of kingship which comes to attract the attention of the philosophers and the writers of the Hellenistic age. They become fascinated about the question of what makes a king a king. So, for example, one definition of the Hellenistic age reads, uh, of, of monarchy in the Hellenistic age, reads as follows. It is neither descent nor legitimacy which gives monarchies to men, but the ability to command an army and to handle affairs competently. Such was the case with Philip and the successors of Alexander. For Alexander's natural son was in no way helped by his kinship with him because of his weakness of spirit, while those who had no connection with Alexander became kings of almost the whole inhabited world. So we've established here the notion that these kings are not kings because they're descended from royal families. They're not. They're bodyguards and generals. Nor even by legitimacy, or as in fact it says really in the Greek, justice. It's not even that they have some right to be king. It's certainly not a question of divine right. They have the right to be king simply because they are competent. They are able to supply their men to command an army and to handle affairs. The justification for this kingship lies in the expression itself of being a great king.
Now other thinkers also were fascinated by this question of where kingship comes from and what makes a king a king. And in one extraordinary document recorded in Diodorus, it becomes clear that some people were playing with the idea that kings and gods were really two sides of the same coin. Let me read you uh, from the doctrines of Euhemerus, who says that Uranus, Uranos to the Greeks, was the first king, an honorable man, beneficent and versed in the movement of the stars, and who was the first to honor the heavenly gods with sacrifices. That's why he was called Uranus. But his wife Hestia had two sons. They reigned in a place off somewhere in the, the perimeter of the Greek world, Pancaya, uh, a kind of fantasy land. And after his death, he then becomes a god. He's taken up into heaven. So the, uh, the Hellenistic age begins with a very fascinating conception of kingship. In a void created by Alexander's death, first we have them playing with the idea of the succession by blood of Alexander. But that doesn't work because we have a child who is a threat to them and a half-wit. And so then we begin playing with the idea of kingship based on valor. And that is why these men must fight these wars for a generation against each other until they finally establish their Hellenistic kingdoms. What then emerges is the political pattern that is going to dominate the next 300 years from essentially the death of Alexander until the Roman conquest of the Hellenistic world. And during that 300 years, as we're going to see in the coming lectures, we will have one kingdom in Egypt controlled by the Ptolemies, another in Syria controlled by Seleucus, and yet another in Macedon. And it is going to be these great dynastic regional kingdoms born out of the void created by Alexander's death that will be the major dynastic blocks of the Hellenistic world. And it will be they who rule independently until finally, by 31 BC, we find the Romans establishing their authority in the Hellenistic world. Welcome back to our sixth lecture now in this series on the Hellenistic Age. So far our story has involved Alexander and his conquests, but we've seen that with his death in 323, the Hellenistic world, the empire that he had conquered, which extended across the Near East all the way to India, was really plunged into turmoil because none of Alexander's successors was capable of maintaining the kind of unified empire that he had created. Partly because, as we saw, none of them were interested in the kind of policy of cultural fusion which Alexander had promoted, at least in the upper echelons of his empire, between Greeks and Persians. Instead, we've seen emerging in the void after his death and after a generation of civil wars, a new political landscape in which the Hellenistic world is broken up into great regional and dynastic blocks. And it's those that we're now going to start to examine a little more closely. The first of these, the one about which we have the most information and probably the most famous then, is that of Ptolemaic Egypt. We've seen that uh, Ptolemy was one of Alexander's bodyguards. We've seen that Ptolemy very cunningly realized upon Alexander's death that Egypt was the one province or satrapy of the Persian Empire which could be most easily maintained on its own, hermetically sealed off, if you like, from the rest of the Mediterranean and the rest of the world. And so it was to Egypt that Ptolemy took himself, transforming himself in the course of his career from bodyguard and general of the Macedonians to satrap of the now dead and departed Alexander, until finally by the end of his career he was a pharaoh. Once again the manifestation of the power of God on earth, at least as far as his Egyptian audience was concerned. In this lecture then, let's look at the way that the Ptolemies administered Egypt and how their dynasty ruled that country for 300 years. Well, I pointed out that Egypt is cut off from the rest of the Mediterranean by desert on two sides, cataracts to the south and the delta to the north. It also has a kind of ethnic and historical unity that goes back thousands of years to the age of the pyramids at least. And so, Altogether, these factors created in Egypt conditions for an immensely stable society. Egyptian society was essentially structured like a pyramid. 
That is to say, the pharaoh was on top, supported underneath by a, uh, higher, uh, by a priestly scribal class, which relied on the pharaoh for their power. And in turn, the pharaoh, his family, and the scribal class, the priestly class, then depended upon the work of the vast majority of peasants living in the Nile Valley. What I'm going to suggest is that Egypt is a good place for examining how Hellenism really works. Because what we're going to find, I think, is that the Greeks and Macedonians only replace the top level of that pyramidically, hierarchically organized society. Ptolemy will replace the pharaoh or the Persian provincial governor, and a Greco-Macedonian elite will supply the upper echelons of the hierarchy that rules this country, but the priests will continue to offer a great deal of stability and they will cooperate with these new Macedonian overlords. And together, those two groups will continue to rule over the vast Egyptian peasantry, for whom Pharaoh, Ptolemy, Persian governor, the differences were negligible. Their lives continued in much the same pattern year after year. So what we find is that the Greeks and the Macedonians are not really interested at all in any kind of cultural fusion between uh, Egyptians and Greeks. And in fact, one of the most uh, heartbreaking documents to come out of the sands of Egypt is a petition written by a man in the Hellenistic period to uh, one of the local officials complaining about the treatment that he's received. And I want to read you the details of this and then I want you to pay attention to exactly what it is that is the nub of the problem. This fellow, whose name we don't know, uh, the beginning of the letter is broken, writes to Zenon and he says, I hope you're healthy. I too am well. You know that you left me with Krotos, that's a good Greek name, and I did everything that was ordered in respect to the camels and was blameless towards you. We don't know exactly what his job was, but perhaps he was a camel driver. When you sent an order to give me pay, he gave me nothing of what you ordered. When I asked repeatedly that he give me what you ordered and Krotos gave me nothing but kept telling me to remove myself, I held out for a long time waiting for you, but then I was eventually compelled to run away. Although I did everything that was ordered and for nine months now all he's given me is, well, no oil, no grain except two-month periods when he also paid for the clothing. This is some sort of allowance. And so our poor complainant says, I'm in difficulties both summer and winter, and he orders me to accept ordinary wine for salary. Well, they have treated me with scorn because I don't speak Greek. Uk Helenidzdo, I don't speak Greek. This poor man is a native Egyptian. He's dealing with some of the uh, Greeks that have come into Egypt, and because he does not speak their language, they regard him as a barbarian. And so, in this instance, they're trying to screw him out of the salary that he deserves. The two groups kept very separate from each other. There was very little intermarriage between the two groups, and we have very full records for Ptolemaic Egypt of documents with both Greek names and Egyptian names. And in the few instances where we do get into marriage, it is invariably between Greek men, new colonists and officials who are pouring into Egypt, and Egyptian women. There are virtually no instances of Egyptian men marrying Greek wives. Most of the Greeks and the Macedonians who pour into Egypt at this time come in to serve in the Ptolemaic bureaucracy. And they remain separate from the Egyptians over whom uh, they exercise power. This distinction between the two ethnic groups is also mirrored in the relationship between the city of Alexandria and the rest of Egypt. Alexandria, according to its foundation myth, and this is probably vastly exaggerated, Alexandria had been laid out, it was said, by Alexander himself. Now, the fact is, Alexander had uh, planted 70 cities across the Near East. Most of them were probably originally garrisons and trading stations, and it is a matter of just historical uh, change that some of them grew into great cities. Samarkand and so forth. This Alexandria probably began the same way, probably as a trading port on the very tip of Egypt, right up there in the delta close to the Mediterranean Sea. But it grew into, it was turned into uh, the capital of the Ptolemaic realm, but it was essentially a Greek city on the outskirts of Egypt. Ptolemies chose not to rule from Memphis, 
or from Thebes, from any of the traditional capitals of the, Tol oh, excuse me, of the, of the pharaohs that had come before them. And even in the Roman period, when the Romans talked about Alexandria, they called it Alexandria ad Egyptum, Alexandria next to Egypt. So these Ptolemaic rulers are almost ruling Egypt, almost as absentee landlords on the very edges, because as good Macedonian Greeks, they're more interested in what's going on in the Mediterranean. That's their realm. That's the realm where their navies operate and their armies operate. Egypt is behind them, and as long as it is a well-run and well-organized system, that's all they care about. In fact, the peasants, the Egyptians living in Egypt, needed permission from their local authorities to enter the city, almost an internal passport, if you will. And so there is a split, I think, in Ptolemaic Egypt between... Uh, there's a, there's a split almost in the way the Ptolemies see themselves in relation to Egypt. It's a, a kind of schizophrenia. The monarch, the Ptolemy, has to be a pharaoh to the Egyptians. He must be a pharaoh to maintain all those traditional Egyptian values of mart, of justice and good order. But to his Greek audience, up in Alexandria, he has to be a Macedonian king. And so in this respect, the Ptolemies are negotiating, I would argue, the same kind of difficulty and dilemma that Alexander faced. Only their solution is to keep the two separate and to really behave almost as two separate dynasties. A Pharaonic dynasty in Egypt and a Macedonian dynasty in Alexandria. On the great temples of Egypt, such as at Karnak, if you go and look at the presentations of these figures of these great pharaohs of Egyptian history, I defy you to distinguish Ptolemy I from Thutmose III, who reigned hundreds of years earlier. In both cases, the pharaoh will be three times larger than life. He will be seen striding manfully forward to attack his enemies. He will have a war club in one hand, and he'll be holding his enemies by the hair in the other hand, ready to smash their brains. And whether it is 2300 BC or 1300 BC or 300 BC, the same imagery is being used. And frankly, if the audience looking at this was illiterate, as invariably most of the peasants were, they were seeing continuity. Ptolemy was Pharaoh to them, but not to the Greeks. So the Ptolemaic system completely abandoned, I think, Alexander's notion of a policy of fusion. One other element that helped to contribute to the Greek occupation of territory here and uh, to the, the split between them was simply the annexation of land. In many parts of Egypt, Greek colonists poured in and simply took over the choice land. Now we happen to have, fortunately, the records of one Egyptian village from the Hellenistic period, a place called Kerkia Cyrus, where we have quite specific details of how the land was owned. And we know that in this small village, 52% of the land was owned by Ptolemy himself. Now, if that's true across all of Egypt, and it probably is, it means that literally half of Egypt is the king's own private domain. All right? And then the next largest category, 33%, belongs to the Greek colonists, clerics as they're called. They simply handed over this land, and as we've seen from our letter to Zenon earlier, we can understand how they treated their Egyptian neighbors. That comprises 85% of the land of Egypt, or at least of Kirkia Cyrus, and I would suggest probably the rest of the country as well. And of the remaining 15%, 6% of that belongs to the temple. So Ptolemy, the Greek colonists, and the Egyptian priests own over 90% of the land around and in this village. And the final 9%, that's the land that is actually owned and run by the Egyptian peasants. In other words, that's the land that they live off. That has to supply all their needs. So what we're finding dramatically in this evidence from Kirkia Cyrus is that the Ptolemaic system is not about fusing Greek and Egyptian. It is about the more thorough and the more complete exploitation of Egypt's resources. Now, Egypt, as I've said, is cut off from the outside world by deserts and cataracts, 
and therefore it's possible to minimize the outside influence on Egypt. And as a result of that, it is a perfect place to be hermetically sealed and to be treated, as it was by the Ptolemies, as a cash cow. Now, they, they took their exploitation of Egypt to phenomenal lengths, and I want to chart some of these for you to give you an idea of exactly how Ptolemaic rule operates in Egypt. First of all, Mediterranean merchants who wanted to come to Egypt because it was so fertile and it supplied so much grain to the Mediterranean basin had to uh, conduct all of their commerce with the king's agents so that anything being exported from Egypt essentially went through the king's warehouses and he took a cut at every level on the contracts, on the storage costs, on the, uh, the produce itself, uh, on uh, stamp duties, everything every bit of money that could be extracted from this system was. Now, one of the ways that the Ptolemies controlled this trade was in this way. International transactions around the Mediterranean involving merchants moving goods backwards and forward were conducted in silver and gold coinage. Now, the, the real weight of that coin attested to the, the, the value of the Ptolemaic economy. It was a sign of good faith because they had real bullion that they could use for their trade. But, Within Egypt itself, gold and silver did not circulate. The peasants never got to see any of that coinage. They got to use copper coinage, which was worthless outside of Egypt. So that it, even in their monetary economy, no Egyptian would ever be able to make any money out of trade. All he could do was barter with other Egyptians and maybe the king's agents. So private commerce then could really never develop in Egypt. The Ptolemaic economy is really like a Stalinist planned economy with complete control exercised by the crown. Now the Ptolemies enjoyed monopolies in all the major uh, export producing crops so that various kinds of oil, olive oil, linseed oil, various grains that were produced, staples that could be grown in abundance through the Nile Valley and exported through uh, the Delta to the Eastern Mediterranean, these were all tightly controlled by the central monopoly under the authority of uh, the, the uh, Ptolemy. The monopolies were therefore not confined just to the sale of produce, but to every aspect of its production. And this is really well documented as a result of many papyri found in the sands of Egypt. And we know from these papyri that the king's agents determined everything from when the land was to be sown, they distributed the seed that was to be sown, they monitored closely the actual use of tools, to be used in the production of any of this produce. They announced the time of harvest. It was they who arranged for the storage and transportation of all of this produce back to Alexandria and they stamped everything to show that they had recorded it and it was all copied out in triplicate. We have astonishingly detailed instructions involving this. And I'd like to read you just a few details of this. They get to be pretty boring after a while, so I won't read you too much. But I want you to pay attention to the astonishing detail of the control of the economy by the Ptolemies. This is from a series of documents dating to the middle of the third century and they involve uh, the revenue laws as they're called. These are the instructions issued by Ptolemy Philadelphus in relation to various monopolies that I've been talking about. This is quite amazing. We read in this document, in this papyrus, those who own implements for making wine shall register with the manager of the farm when, and then there's a gap, and when they are about to make wine, they shall exhibit the seal placed on them to show it is intact. So they, they have to produce a seal to show that all the vessels that they've been given and what they produce is still intact. Anyone who fails to register or to produce, uh, or to produce his um, implements in accordance with the law or to bring them for sealing when the farmer wishes to seal them, in other words, when they're finished with their winemaking implements, such as a press, for example, a wine press. Uh, anyone who, sh who does that shall pay forthwith to the fax 
tax farmers the amount of the loss they estimate they've made. So even if you've got a little bit of land and you're growing just a few vines on it and you're going to produce some wine, you have to get your press, your wine press, and the pruning shears from the king's agent. And you have to sign for those and there is a seal put on them and you've got to have that seal when you come back. Otherwise, you get charged for it as well. This is really what we would call micromanagement down to the very last detail of the economy, the whole thing is being handled uh, by the Ptolemies. Every aspect of production, therefore, was overseen by this Greek bureaucracy that reached all the way from the court in Alexandria down to a slew of local officials. We have, for example, a letter uh, which comes from the chief economic official up in Alexandria, known as the Dioiketes, and he's sending this regulation or this letter down to the local governor uh, further south. And he says to him, you must inspect the canals and the water conduits, conduits which run through the fields and from which the peasants are accustomed to take water to the land cultivated by each of them. And you have to see whether the water intakes into them have the prescribed depth. This is incredible. In the little uh, canals running from the Nile out into the fields, these Greek officials have to go and measure the depth of the canal to make sure it's deep enough for the water into the fields. In your tours of inspection, try in going from place to place to cheer everybody up and put them in better heart. I'll bet people loved hearing that. And not only should you do this by words, but also if any of them complain to the local officials about any manner touching it, you should make inquiry and put a stop to such things as far as possible. Now, what this note puts us in mind of is the fact that the Ptolemaic system was so thoroughly exploitative and so carefully managed that it necessarily resulted in a great deal of resistance. The most common category of document that we get from, the, from Ptolemaic Egypt is the petition, the complaint, by some poor peasant who is being hard put upon by people who are oppressing him. Here's an example of one such document. It's a complaint about the owner of a lodging. And the complainant writes directly to Ptolemy. Go to the top. I doubt that Ptolemy ever read this. And I'll explain why in a minute. But the letter reads, To King Ptolemy, greetings from Bithus, one of the veterans of Cardenas. You gave to us, O king, a lodging with the other uh, colonists so that we might not be wronged by anyone or have to pay for lodging. But Hellanicus has forcibly entered the house. He's demolished the wall of the courtyard and moved in. Now, I earlier submitted a petition to you, O king, about these matters, which was transmi uh, transmitted to the general, but the man is still unwilling to give it to me and continues to insult me. I beg you, therefore, O king, if it seems right to you, to write and to fix this matter. May I obtain justice." So every little complaint, imagine if you had a, a tenant in your house and you were trying to get rid of them. Would you write to the President of the United States? This is what's going on in Egypt. And the reason why I think that Ptolemy never got the letter is because at the bottom of the document, written in another hand, is the note put down by the scribe who finally received this petition. Aginor to Timoxenus, greeting. I've sent you a copy of the petition that came to me from this fellow. If it was assigned to him, assigned to them their shares in accordance. In other words, the Ptolemaic bureaucratic system was wonderfully devised to allow people at the bottom to write to the top so that people at the top could write back down to the local officials and say, look into it. And we quite literally have archives in which over the space of more than a generation or two, people write dozens of letters and clearly get no redress whatsoever. The system isn't concerned with justice. It's concerned with an efficient exploitation of all the economic resources. Every aspect of production then is overseen by a, a Greek bureaucracy. We know of local officials, we know of local mayors, we know of local policemen, we know of local scribes, and virtually all of these are Greek. In fact, these petitions are all written in Greek, which means that those that came from the Egyptian peasants were not being written by them directly, they were going to the local scribe and paying to have their petition put into the language of the Greeks. This controlled economy relied on treating the laoi, as the Greeks called them, the peasants, just as the pharaohs had done, in exactly the same way. But it also required the complicity of the temple estates, the great priestly families, particularly those of Memphis. Now, 
the Egyptian priestly class was for the most part protected by the Ptolemies. And clearly here the Ptolemies thought about what it was that was needed to make the system run smoothly. The priestly class, the scribes and the priests who ran the old religion, were given the same rights and privileges that they had had during the earlier pharaonic period. They were given large parcels of land and they were able to live freely off its produce. And in turn, and this is really a contractual arrangement, what they then did was to acknowledge successive pharaohs just as their rights were acknowledged by successive pharaohs. Particularly in the second and first century, as the Ptolemies grew weaker and weaker, we find that some of the most remarkable and some of the lengthiest inscriptions to come to us from the Ptolemaic world are inscriptions that show negotiations between the priests and the central authority. Because, of course, every time a, a, a Ptolemy was weak, his priests would gouge more land, more prerogatives and more rights out of him in return for their support. In fact, probably the most famous document in all of Egyptian history, the Rosetta Stone, a trilingual inscription, which was the first inscription that allowed us to actually translate uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, is in fact a Ptolemaic document. It dates to 196 BC. It comes from the reign of Ptolemy V, and what that document contains in it is a series of tax breaks. Now, it's an excruciatingly long document. I wouldn't begin to read you the details of it. But what it shows is that this young, weak king was relying on the support of the Memphite priesthood in order to maintain his authority in his kingdom. Now, I've painted a fairly bleak picture of the Ptolemaic control of Egypt so far, intentionally so. It was a top-heavy control exercised by a Greco-Macedonian elite, to be sure. But there are a couple of other elements that we should throw into the mix here, because the Ptolemies did, in some ways, attempt to make their power more acceptable or more palatable to their Egyptian uh, subjects. Probably the most curious practice in this regard, uh, a practice which seems to be designed to gain legitimacy for the Ptolemies in the eyes of their Egyptian subjects, is the practice of incestuous marriage within the Ptolemaic dynasty. Ptolemy II, the son of the founder of the dynasty, in 275 BC married his sister Arsinoe. And they were known throughout the rest of their joint reign as the Theoi Philadelphoi, that is to say, the brother and sister loving gods. And they'd already claimed this status for themselves. But what does this marriage mean and how would it work with its different audiences? Well, some Greek gods had been regarded as living in incestuous relations. The, uh, the father of gods and men, Zeus, was married to his sister Hera, yes. But in ordinary Greek practice, the idea of marrying your sister was certainly regarded as disgusting. And in fact, we have some amazingly uh, disgusting poems written at the time about Ptolemy marrying his sister and presumably having sexual relations with her. This offended most of the Greeks. But it probably was designed to play to an Egyptian audience. In the Egyptian pantheon, at least in late Egyptian religion, two of the most important gods had been Isis and Osiris. And these were regarded as both husband and wife and brother and sister. So this practice of marrying one sister, which took place amongst the Ptolemies and was continued by later members of the dynasty, was probably an attempt on their part to cast themselves in the role of the, the living embodiment of Isis and Osiris, the chief mother and father god within the Egyptian pantheon. Uh, that may have been their intention. It certainly offended the Greeks, and I don't know that it ever persuaded any of the Egyptians. Nevertheless, the practice continued for uh, essentially 300 years. Even Cleopatra VII, the famous Cleopatra, who we'll be talking about at the end of these, these uh, lectures, was for a time married to her own brother, uh, Ptolemy the uh, 13th. The other attempt that was made by the, uh, the Ptolemies to try to bridge some of the gap between Egyptian culture, the culture of the, the conquered, and their own culture, was in the creation of a new religious cult. And this is really a, a, a bizarre story. 
it was a religious cult that was based on the figure of Serapis. And Serapis himself is a figure who is a, 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 a synthesis of both Osiris from the Egyptian pantheon and the Apis bull, which had gained in uh, respect in later Egyptian history. So these two figures have already been put together, Osiris and Apis. And then they're treated now by the Greeks as a new god called Serapis. But this, this god is really very un-Egyptian in appearance. We have statues and busts of this god uh, Serapis, and he looks really very much like Zeus and Asclepius and even to some extent Apollo. So it looks as if we have a figure which is in some ways recalling Egyptian religion, but is also geared towards Greek religion. And in fact, we even know that Ptolemy II, who was responsible for the creation of this cult, actually imported Greek priests from Greek cities to come to Egypt and to write a liturgy. In other words, to write the, the hymns and the poems uh, to be recited in honor of this god. So it represents a very curious fusion because all the trappings and all the external appearance of it is really Greek, and yet the central figure is borrowed from the Egyptians. And some have argued that because of this packaging, if you will, it's not really designed for an Egyptian audience at all, but rather it's designed for those Greeks who are fascinated by everything Egyptian. And that may well be true, because the fact of the matter is that in the Ptolemaic period, even though the worship of the Apis bull remained quite a, a powerful uh, religious presence in the Egyptian world, the cult of Serapis and the cult that went with it, that of Isis, now presented as a Greek goddess, these two cults were actually much more popular outside of Egypt. In fact, they were really the most successful export of the Ptolemaic uh, Egyptian dynasty. A cult that was a repackaged version of pseudo-Egyptian religion designed for a Greek audience. Now the Greek world uh, in the Hellenistic period was as fascinated by Egypt as we are still today. They also looked at the pyramids and thought that these were strange and wonderful monuments. And the Greeks had for hundreds of years thought that Egypt was the ancient fountain of all wisdom. So it may be that what the Ptolemies were doing in this cult of Serapis and the cult of Isis was tapping into that awe, that respect, that veneration that the Greeks felt for the Egyptians. Tapping into that and now appropriating it for themselves so that what had been Egyptian now became Ptolemaic.